This is the original eSport racing game. This is iRacing. When it comes to this circuit, you think about history, prestige, and the challenges to win and conquer this tough circuit. Over the past 100 or so years, the 24 Hours of Le Mans has been one of the most famous races in all of the globe. And today, the major series' European split will conquer the circuit it races on for the next 2.4 hours. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening from across the iRacing world, and welcome to the Major Series Le Mans 2.4 from the circuit des 24 hours to Le Mans in Le Mans, France, to decide who will be able to conquer this challenging circuit for the next two hours and 24 minutes. In the broadcast booth today, I'm Justin Prince, alongside me, as well in the director's seat, is Randy Chinnett for what will be an entertaining race from start to finish. The top drivers are getting all set to go. 51 drivers, three different classes, all set to duke out and battle across this gigantic 8.47 mile circuit across France. The question is, which team will come out on top? It's a challenging racetrack from start to finish. 38 turns to conquer, Randy. Single drivers for these machines trying to battle to decide who's going to have the best run overall with the points getting more and more intensified. Christian Chowder entering today with a gigantic gap in the point standings, Randy. It's going to be tough to challenge him. He's won four of the six events so far for the major series. Yeah, Christian for these Euro splits has been absolutely on fire out out in front. A Matthias Magnussen by 357 points. Gabriel Rue a further basically 70 points back. It's it's basically all on Challoner at this point. He's set himself up for a fantastic year and he's really delivering here in 2019. Indeed he is so far. You can tell with the intensity of the music and the intensity of the cars. We only have a minute until they hit the circuit here today. Chowner leads the point standings by 357 total for the pro standings. Mateus Magnuson, Gabriel Ruz, Joel Volarde, Joshua Wolf round out the top five. On top of that, the sportsman's class has been fairly tight this season. 158 points for Adam Franciaponte over Sean A. Fleming so far this season. But Cohen morts off within range despite having one less event ran. But, as we've seen over the years, experience can come into play. Juan Ball has that experience at the top of the legend standings. Andy Banfield, Michael Lane amongst the drivers, looking to take a W for that. But we're 20 seconds away from the start here today. It's a challenging racetrack, as hit upon 38 turns, 8.47 miles. As you see with the weather, it's a fairly hottish 76 degrees air temp. Track temp is fairly cool, in fact, at 97 degrees, with some winds kicking up around the racetrack about 6 to 7 miles per hour. That's around 11 or 12 kilometers here, Randy. Yeah, so it's a little bit of a warm day here in France, but other than that, it's somewhat ideal conditions, I think, for these guys. Track temp, like you said, a little bit up there because of the clear skies, but regardless, it's time to take you through our starting grid. 
Yes, indeed. Three classes of cars will hit the track today. They qualified since the new build came out on Tuesday. This was how they qualified. Let's start off with the LMP1 class for today with your running orders if we can, because a month where the classes, I should pardon me, say, it's the LMP1s that are going to lead them to the grid, as you see up on your screen. Ethan e Ian Allen Hayward out of the front. David K. Baker, Pascal Eber, Aloma Bate, Sherrick, Christopher Moreau, Joshua Wolf round out the top six. Alex Johnson, Travis Henderson with Elliot White and Stan Ambis inside the top ten. Round out the drivers in the field. David H. Baker, Diego Jimenez, Harmelia, Trevor Provorsky, James Ewens, John M. Roberts, and Robert Lungan. Behind that, in the 17th on back overall position, with the drivers in the HBD machine. Leading them to the green flag will be Jerome Haig with Alexis B. Hurt, along with Daniel Croft, Jamie Rushworth, Marcus Niskanen, Claude Berval, and along with Darwin Mintz and Eric Mick inside the top 24 overall. Thomas Peterson, Michael Lane up there as well with Peter Blarcia and Oliver Sylvia Barrera. Adam Fanciapane will drive in that class today alongside Edouis Peculius, along with Lonnie Finch, Shawnee Fleming, rounding out the field, Sylvian Malone. Then, after, as we run these down, will be the GTE machines. That's led by the fastest time by Pierre Garcerecio, with Hugo Prado and Christian Schauder inside the top three. Tim Klossens qualified for the group, with David Barraclo behind that. The rest of the grid will roll on your screen now. So the rest of the GTs, the rest of the field. Again, 51 cars put in qualifying times and registered for today's race. The first of the cars that'll reach the green flag will be the LMP1s and their class here today. Again, it'll be Ethan Ian Allen Hayward. An interesting name with an interesting looking car. Looking to have a strong race in his green and pink machine. He'll start alongside the yellow David H. David E. Baker machine. As they work their way to the final parts of the racetrack before the green flag. Randy, before we take this green flag, what should we be watching for here as we start things off tonight? Uh, watch out for some fast race cars. Watch out for some fast drivers. This is going to be a fantastic show here, I think, for the next nearly two and a half hours here around Le Mans. Sean. Sean A. Fleming and Jerome Haig amongst the drivers who have elected to start from Pitt Road here today. There are some of the drivers in the HPD class. Haig, of course, the fastest in the HPDs. The pace car is off the track, however. Hayward will lead them to the green flag, along with David H. Baker, driving towards the final four chicanes and towards the green flag. Single file, they go, the green flag. So we're underway for the 2.4 hours of Le Mans here today. And Hayward with a bit of a slowdown as David E. Baker quickly makes the pass heading into turn number one. So an interesting move already off the start. We've seen them go single file to the green flag. They're single file to the top five. Let's head to the HPDs. Again, their leader started from the pits. Daniel Croft led them to the green flag. Rushworth, Niskanen, Berval, and Mintz rounds out the top five as they work their way to the first chicanes. The GTEs are also working their way towards the first chicane with Pierre Garacio leading them with Hugo Preto, Christian Schallander, Tim Clausens, David Barraclo inside the top five. Of course, there are many different splits across the European region. 144 total drivers entered for this race for the Mon 2.4 to survive 2.4. To the overall race lead, though, Hayward and Baker battling. Hayward gets it back. Able to get the run down the most same straight as they leave the first of the two chicanes. And you can see down the hill how much speed you can gain and how many passing opportunities pop up, including with those HPDs in the backdrop. Hayward up towards the front for the time being, but the draft being picked up by Baker. 204 miles per hour, they go into the left-hand chicane. Baker, though, attacking much more aggressive, misses the apex exit. Pascal Eber loses some time as well, along with Majak Shurhan and pardon me, amongst that grouping. But the top five, all single file for the time being. The HPDs as well still see Croft holding on in front of Rushworth and Niskanen who's put away from the battle for Minsk, Berval, and Mick amongst their tracking group.
Again, the estimated time today, again, two hours, 24 minutes for the drivers on the racetrack today. We are looking at the GTE grouping just now on your screen as Christian Challenger is to the head towards second position. Gracio was able to pull away a decent amount of time already in the first part of the racetrack. However, Challenger was able to use the draft and run side by side with his Porsche to make the pass on the BMW. They're still side by side, however, working their way to the Mosang corner. On the outside, Challenger. On the inside line, Klaassen's watching behind as Preto defends. Tries to work his way down the Indianapolis straight. We apologize for any technical issues. RaceBot TV and our crew is currently working on rectifying the issue here for today's broadcast. As we continue to follow along with the GTE battle for second spot. Preto trying to run the outside preferred line. Schauner getting a push from Klaassen from behind. Still speeding their way towards Indianapolis. The quick left-hander as Schauner able to get cleared on by and get the preferred single file corner exit. So Schauner up to second. Preto to third. Klaassen's in fourth position. His teammate David Barraclo lines up inside the top five. Also some of the drivers that start towards the back. Jerome Hank. Starting to work their way through the traffic you might see in the backdrop. That's the HPD of the 678 of Jerome Hag that had to start from the pits along with Fleming. Alexis Bieber is not on the racetrack, meanwhile, we should note. He has missed the start. He is not on the track at the time of the green flag. Along with that, you still see the battle still shaping up for that second place. The lead overall for Hayward has pulled away for the time being by 1.6 seconds, we should note, for the, for the LMP. Alex Johnson, the dead end of the grouping, going to fall down the overall leaderboard as Challenger still holds on for the time being. This is one of the closest battles so far on the racetrack. Challenger so far separated by about three seconds-ish. To the next car up for position on this circuit. We've completed our first lap of many here today. No current estimate on the track so far. The lap time seen three minutes and 24 seconds for the LMP1s. The HPD seen times in 330s while the GTEs are following along with went into as low as the four minutes but ran around the 350s. It looks like one of the top points runners, Adam Fanciaponti, has ducked his car into the pit lane as well. You see that right there on your screen. He was, right now, he was in decent position on the track and has already drawn to sacrifice position. There was, of course, some potential penalties to watch for here today. And we apologize for any technical issues you are seeing here for today's broadcast. We are currently working on rectifying the issue here on Ringspot TV. We're looking at the 848 machine as Pascal Eber is up to second spot. And it looks like that might have been David E. Baker that sacrificed a lot of time as we're looking at everything on this racetrack. Yes, indeed, that's in case indeed it was. Some cars had gone off and missed parts of the chicanes. In the first chicane, in fact, David E. Baker, I think, lost the most amount of time and nearly ran over the back of Travis Henderson. And it also lost some time in the first sector on the racetrack and dropped to seven. Again, the front two, Hayward and Ebener, at the moment on this racetrack. And right now, as we continue to rectify the issue, we'll go into race spot radio mode here on the iRacing Esports Network for the moment. As we continue to work to rectify the issue, we apologize for any technical issues you are seeing on your side of your broadcasting window. We also like to apologize if you're seeing a Windows folder on your screen at this moment. As right now, let's talk about the battle short forming up for P number three overall on the racetrack. Joshua Wolf working on the outside line, working towards the Ford Chicane, letting on by some drivers. Christopher Morno and Mateus Schurhack able to make the pass. So some interesting strategy games being played so far in this race. We're also seeing them have to let on by David E. Baker. So something going on with a few different cars all of a sudden here. 
Joshua Wolf has dropped all the way back to eighth position all of a sudden. So something is going on with the with the LMP1 class leaders all of a sudden. As we're continuing to work on rectifying the issues, that is all settled down in terms of what's been going on with, in terms of David E. Baker and Wolf. But something going on with some of the LMP1s losing tons of time and letting on lots of drivers by. We'll try and get some information on the re reasonings behind that as soon as we can. Hashtag blame Randy here for today's race. For the HPDs, Daniel Kraft is leading in by four car lengths. Heading towards the first corners. And heading through the Dunlop chicane towards the Dunlop Bridge. Jamie Rushworth having much more later breaking into the corners. Miskinen trying to reel him in behind by a car length and a half on the back end. Utilizing the draft for the time being. Niskanen though overran the apex. Had to check up on the brakes. Lost himself a car length once more for the HPD battle for position. But again the GT3E leader at the moment. Pierre Gunrancio is passing by the start and finish line. Sean Fleming is wedged between him and second place in that class. Christian Schellner. He holds off Clausen's Baraclo and Dimitri Densov. Inside the top five, this time by the stripe. They have an estimated 36 laps to go for the GTEs at the moment. The HPDs are estimated about 38 laps around the track. While the LMP1s are estimated 41 circuits around the track today. Let's catch back up with radio mode with the Indianapolis straight. Because Hayward is currently keeping up in front of Ebener at the moment. If though, for those just tuning in, we are currently working, working to rectify technical issues. You are watching Race Spot TV and the iRacing Esports Network. Please stand by as we follow along with the action here today. As Ebener is separated by four car lengths, the gap is officially eight tenths of a second. Ebener, though, was faster last time with a, the fastest lap of the race so far. 318.440 on the circuit so far today. However, the strength so far for Hayward has been off the corners. The biggest run for Ebener has been, with the help of the draft, to be really able to reel in the time and then some back. He loses on corner exit so far. Ebener running towards the right side of the rumble, strips the Porsche curves, runs his way on the left side. Taking a little tighter line compared to Hayward on the circuit. Back along the high line, back to the middle line. As we continue to see them fall along with Ebener. They're still falling to the tire tracks, at least trying to with the back end of Hayward for the time being. The gap has grown by two tenths of a second since I finished started speaking towards that battle. Make it three tenths of a second. Hayward much quicker to the four chicanes. If it avoid the rumble strips, avoid any type of damage across the stripe. This time, had the fastest lap so far, 318.284, while Ebener had stayed in the fours. Morneau ran a seven last time. But Travis Henderson has had trouble. He spun around in the first part of the four chicane. He got hit from behind by Elliot White by an absolute punt that sent him off into the grass. That was the battle for what was around eighth position. Where Henderson has now dropped down to 13th after getting punted from behind. He now has some back damage on the front and some front end damage on his number 24 machine. Some, some, some bad damage on that race car that was again hit from behind by what appeared to be Elliot White. Elliot White took it straight to the tow truck and into the pit lane. They do have one fast repair available on the racetrack for today we're also seeing marcus niskanen come into the pits so niskanen for the hpds has come in from 19th position overall in the top three so another driver with some type of an issue all of a sudden in this race as everything goes crazy on the racetrack Let's head back to the GTE lead, though, in terms of the description. Because Mauricio is in the lead at the moment. He's holding on, though, barely because Chowner, Clausens, and Baraclo are actually newly bump drafting each other out of the Porsche curves. Chowner using all the real estate coming out of the Porsche curves. Running his way towards the Porsche chicane. Staying out of the blue stuff. Clausens takes a look, stays on the outside line as they move from right side to left side. 
Left, right, they go back to the quick left. Over the rumble strips and hard challenger. Avoids damage on the left front suspension though of the kinetic racing machine. As he gets back to within the slipstream last time by, he was in a 352 range. That was three seconds slower than your class leader. However, they gained a lot of time overall on the 863. 863 running a bit wider compared to Challoner. He is looking faster in this Porsche on the outside lines at this moment. Working away by some of the cones in the GTE class. Challoner letting the car roll more on the apex through the first, through some of the lefts and through the S's before they head down the Mulsane straight. Through the quick right side, passing on by one of the stadiums as they move by in towards the city streets and past some of the businesses and houses here in the town of Lamar. Chowder lost some speed once more, heading towards the Mosang straight, and is barely within reach of the draft at the moment. 177 is the speed. The car in front is in 177 just now in his Ferrari for the GTR eSport machine. He's trying to take the higher line, later breaking by Chowder in the Porsche. Both of the Torque Freak racing machines following nose to tail on behind, able to match the same breaking mark. Challenger only gaining about a car length with that advantage. For those just tuning in, we are on Race Bot Race Radio mode here on the iRacing Esports Network as we continue to rectify technical issues here for the Major Series European Splits top split coverage with Oman 2.4. Challenger not able to gain much time. In fact, Clausens is able to gain more time on the back and a Challenger with the draft. Through this left hand chicane, they go down the most same straight. Challenger more tighter through the rumble strips, can't make it stick. Ends up staying in second in the class for the time being. Hayward in the HLMP1 class is still in the lead by 1.46 seconds and growing over even or so far. Alex Johnson back on the track has already gained some time on Travis Henderson was involved in that incident before. But Daniel Croft is in the lead right now over Jamie Rushworth for the HPDs by three car lanes. They're through the Porsche curves at the moment. The focus still stays on one of the closest battles, then most intense battles shaping up. Henderson is in for the LMP ones of the time being. They'll be passed by potentially by the GTEs that are working their way on the right side of the racetrack, heading towards the Porsche curves and towards Indianapolis. Good racio getting reeled in quickly. To the left side of the track goes Chowner. Chowner going to potentially bonsai move it. No, he backs out of the gas heading into Indianapolis. But that's a part of the racetrack you do not want to be side by side in. It's only two car, two and a half car lanes wide for a race car. And Gun Race Racio has already got some damage on the GTR Esport machine. As I believe we now have visuals back on the race broadcast here today, Randy. As this continues to shape up, we are still continuing to rectify some of our technical issues as we continue this on here today. Yeah, to apologize once again to our viewers here watching industry. the Major Series European split for today. As you're looking at that battle at the moment for the GTEs, where Goratio has been the strongest through the Porsche curb so far compared to them so far. Randy, again, rectified it looks like the technical issues for the time being, but this, these battles are starting to be intensified for this class. Yeah, I think we're okay, but uh, yeah, you're right. Things get really heated up as you see the teammates going out in a little bit there behind Challoner. A couple of torque freak cars and Tim Clayson's and David Bearclaw on the run towards the Ford Chicane. They're not going to work each other too hard, but you see the three uh, the three uh, drivers from the German Marquis trying to keep up with the prancing horse out there in front. And some of the fellow classmates are going to have to deal with some traffic already. And it's involving some of the cars that had to pit and their start from the back, and it looks like. And a fancy Apati, who came into the pits, is also working his way up. Along with Marcus Niskanen. Right now, they are closing in quickly. Schauner has been slowest in the second half of the racetrack, as well as through the Dunlop curb so far. The fastest part of the racetrack for him has been down on the into the Mosang corner and down the Indianapolis straight so far today. Chowder still separate now. And the LMP1 leader has spun. It's Hayward. He has spun out. That is that green and pink machine. He has spun out on his own approaching lap traffic. He nearly ran over the back of Jared Morgan, locked it up and nearly hit the wall, might have actually touched the wall on the left side of the track. 
And you're seeing that on your screens right now. A bad mistake trying to avoid Jared Morgan, it looked like. And that gives Pascal Evener the race lead. And that was a guy that was gaining some fan appeal with that very uh, interesting colored race car. Took too much speed, had lap traffic ahead, hooked it left, tried to lock it up, still sets it off the racetrack. He was also passed by Christopher Morno, but that mistake and lost five plus seconds. So again, Pascal Ebener now up to the race lead in the class for the time being. Stan Abus and Scherhenick inside the top five as well in the class. I have to go back to race spot radio once again. We apologize again for the technical issues here on today's broadcast as we've seen the blocked up rear brakes. Hashtag blame Randy. But hashtag blame PC power as well, I think you can technically say at that point. But in all seriousness, let's head back to the racing action. Because right now, the GTE lead is separated out. And for now, Evener is separated by four seconds. The question is, can he hold on to it? He's working his way to the first of some of the traffic. And the GTE is getting around Rob Gall. Next car he has to work around is Elvis Benello. And he wants to work around Richard McClure and Kevin Mills as the next cars that are right up in front of him as he works his way down the Indianapolis straight so far here today. Even Earl Corley working on the right side of the racetrack, passing by the tree lines, moves to the left side, passes by the Toyota hybrid sign. Has one more car in front, Richard McClure to deal with as he works into Indianapolis. The difference in speed. 80 in the apex to 80 even on the exit. In fact, for Evener, he rolled as much as 90 plus miles per hour into the section as he runs towards the back end of the blue machine in the GT class. McClure lets him on by quickly on the left side of the racetrack. Right side, Evener able to get back to the left side and pass by along the pavement at this point on this circuit. Again, an estimated 33 to go for the GTE class at the moment. Evener in the class lead for the LMP1s. Croft in the lead for the HPDs. And Gun Ratio in the lead now by two seconds over Christian Chowner in the GTE class. That's this. We'll have to take a quick break here on Race Spot TV and the iRacing Esports Network. We'll be back right after these messages. You're watching the major series, the European region, the Lons 2.4. Welcome back, everyone. Apologies again for the technical issues you're on race spot. You're welcome to the LMP1 leader, Pascal Evener, who holds on to a six-second advantage. That's for the time being, as he has just lapped the GTE leader for this moment. As now, he is still trying to put some cars in some distance ahead in terms of traffic. If you look to second, you'll see what's helping him. A train of GTEs are holding up both Hayward, who's moved back to second, and Morneau, who's able to work on by all of them. Ethan Ivan Allen Hayward is trying to recover from that spin. And 
has already been looking faster than Morneau. However, Morneau's got the draft down the Indianapolis straight. Indianapolis might be able to break it up here because they got Pierre Gonracio to get right on around at this point. The lap time difference between the, the first group and second and third is currently a second. The fastest car last time by is actually in fourth position. Majak Sherhanek at the moment. Sherhanek is trying to use the traffic as a pick. Gun ratio stays on the left side and, and allows the traffic on the right side. That is Sten Abbas the second that's running in fifth position all of a sudden. It appears that, yes, indeed, this would be the first point pain race in the, in the European splits, if I'm looking at this correctly, of 2019 in the major series. Also, one of the first times, at least I've personally seen, that green and pink monstrosity. No offense to the driver, just an interesting paint scheme. That is, well, highlighter green, highlighter pink, and nearly said hello to the red paint. He was able to hold on to it for the time being. Again, Morno is in third position, and some drivers apparently and some viewers are very impressed with what they've been seeing with the 286, with the British flag on his machine and the Scandinavian region driver. Just past two hours to go for those just tuning in as well on Race Bond TV and the iRacing Esports Network as we track around the track. Let's go through a top eight rundown for those that are tuning in and confused on what's going on here in terms of some of the stuff going on. Let's start off with the LMP M1 so far on this racetrack. Pascal Ebener is in first position in front of Ethan Ivan Allen Hayward. A handful of a name, a handful of a paint scheme and having a decent amount of pace. However, he's lost some from that spin. Morno is in third, with Sherhanek in fourth. Sten Ambis the second is in fifth, with Joshua Wolf, Trevor Verversky coming off that strong Indy 500, and Diego Jimenez Familia rounding out the top eight. David A. B. Baker's in ninth, who is as high as second today. Daniel Kraft is in the first spot for the HPDs, with Jamie Rushworth in second, Eric Mick in third, but Darwin Mintz inside the top four. Claude Baval is staying on the back end of Mintz. Michael Lane has lost some time in position towards that direction six. Notice Botekulis is in the seventh spot with Thomas Peterson rounding out the top eight for the class. For the GTEs, it has become a commanding lead for Pierre Garacio for the time being. Christian Challoner, Tim Clausens, and David Burkle inside the top four. Mateus Magnussen wanting to keep up with Challoner in the points. It's currently in a deficit if this race finished off now in the class in fifth overall set class. Prado, Dementsov, and Velarde round out your top eight for the GTE class. So that's a look at your top eight for each class for the time being. Now the interest... Now, right now, one of the interesting things is how the strategies are playing out. We've seen a ton of drivers so far take uh, peculiar pit stop decisions. We're still waiting for the response in terms of why the, some of the drivers came in. Some of them may do be due to penalties. There was a penalty given if you drove through the driver's meeting to at least one driver for today's race, I believe. And that's something that is going to be a storyline the rest of the day. However, there is one other note. While there's a difference in some pace between the cars, if we go to the LMP1s and look at the manufacturer specifically, there is something that was noted when we've seen the 24 hours of Le Mans. If you have a specific manufacturer, there is a difference of up to eight seconds in the pit lane. That is the Audi that is quicker than the Ferrari. Even or is in a Ferrari, Porsche, I should say, pardon me, even her in a Porsche, Hayward is in the Audi. That could be, that could play in a potential possibility of a swap after the pits. There's also less fuel in that Porsche 
we should note inside the potential tank. The most they can make it is around 11-ish laps in the 24 hours of Le Mans. The Audi could make it an extra lap at 12, and that led in turn for the class winners in the 24-hour race for the official race for iRacing to have three less pit stops by the end of the night. As a storyline we'll keep up to date with as the race goes on right now at the moment they're on for comparison's sake on their ninth laps around the track so they will potentially come down the pits for the first time in the next nine minutes or so every other class is currently separated by a decent amount on the racetrack for the time being still first and second are fairly close in those hpds we've been keeping on mentioning much as two seconds the gap between Kraft and Rushworth but they pull it away from Eric Mick for the time being and Horatio is still up in the front of Flossen and Challenger now who have swapped spots with Barracle in the fourth position with the gigantic gap between the top with second third and fourth as you can see with some of the intensity and the action Lots of reps going into some of these cars. We've also seen a change in the third issue in the back draw. The panic will be able to make the pass for a full the third position in the past half lap. You're looking at the 73 and the triple five on your screen. That's Challenger and Barraclo. Right now, Clausens is in front. Clausens trying to defend outside line. Challenger on the left side of the circuit. Able to draft on by as they go into the left hand chicane. So move Chowder back up a position for the time being. Barraclo has also lost some ground to that, that battle again for second position for the time being. As Horatio is currently at the moment without the draft half a second quicker. However, fuel saving could be affected by not being in that draft as this race continues on and could be a difference of a lap or two in the big picture. Challenger overcooks the corner, nearly running him over that time was Clausen. Clausen's able to avoid the wall as he moves back up to second. It looked like Clausen plants at the corner perfectly, however, for the look of Challenger, he tried to set it in a little hotter than he should have, lost the back end, saved the car, clipped the grass, and ended up going a little bit through the sand as well before getting the car back going. He did get a very slight tap from the Torque Freak Racing Machine. Lassen's currently still trying to hold on to the second position up on your screens at the moment. Brayto falling back to fifth position, Magnuson behind that. Alarde losing lots of time, able to find the pass by Densoff as they work by some of the LMP1 traffic going towards their side. LMP1 lead is nine seconds for the time being. Kraft is currently in the lead by a second over Jamie Rushworth. And the ratio is still having to actually hold up Elliot Light and lets him on by. Fifty-two minutes and fifty-three seconds on the clock here for the Le Mans two point four hours here on Race Spot TV and the iRacing and Esports Network. Let's head towards the battle if we can for the HPD lead because it's getting starting to get a little intense. Rushworth is currently saving some fuel. However, each time it looks like that Rushworth has been getting closer and closer and closer for that position. That is for 17th overall on the racetrack today. Craft a bit faster towards the midpoint of the straightaway. Rushworth approaching the Porsche curves now, trying to follow the line a bit more safer, it looks like, in the dirty air. A bit more tighter, rather. 
while Kraft is letting the car hang out a slight touch more with the left rear in the cleaner air in his HPD. Kraft working his way now into the Ford Chicane in the set battle we're following along with Conway the quick left right. Conway hits the brakes earlier along the rumble strips not too hard to damage the bottom floor. Not too aggressive to overcook the corner. This time by, both of them ran in the 335s. In fact, he ran a bit faster Kraft did. You, they will have to deal with Tom drilling up in front in just a little bit. Once again, they pulled away from Eric Mick, who's in third with Mint in the fourth position. This, this is itself out. Meanwhile, things continue to get interesting, by the way, with those GTEs, because Colossus is holding on to second spot. He got it back by the time he got to the strike. With that mistake, however, Chowner wants it back. Chowner has been really quick down in Indianapolis. He'll have a chance to get the run if he times it up right on the back end of the Torque Freak Racing Machine. Lawson's taking a bit of a higher line in the right, on the right side of the racetrack. While Challenger still falls in towards the slipstream. 174 miles per hour compared to 172. As Challenger might not be able to make it in time to make a move through this time through Indianapolis. He lets off the brakes. Stays behind, lets the car roll. Takes the more rumble strip line, gets loose because of the inside line. Able to keep the traction though in the corner exit by saving it, turning it more towards the right. Does it again though as he keeps it stable. And Chowder, the points leader, entering today. Right now, a lot of point implications in some of the air classes. We've seen Travis Henderson dead last in the LMP1 class. Due to that incident we've seen before for Grizzly Motorsports. Has had one top five and six starts in the series so far. Eric Mick is in decent point position and his third position. But others, again, have absolutely not had the days they want to have so far. Ballarde still back in the bottom half of the top ten. From losing time, he's in 13th in the points. Just not everybody's day so far. The local time right now is 17.44, 22 in sim at the moment for today's race. For those that are wondering, that is about 5.44 p.m. local. With the pace we are running, we will finish still, I believe, in the daylight for today here in France with 1 hour 48 minutes and 27 seconds on the clock. And my broadcast partner once again, who has been out fixing the technical issues that you've been seeing in today's director, Randy Chin. Randy, glad to have you back in the booth. Yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad to be back. That's a stressful uh, first 40 minutes of this stream for sure. As, uh, well, at least we get it wrapped up and uh, get the problems, I think, all sorted and situated out as we uh, probably are approaching near the end of this first stint. And they're going to go four wide just about here with these LMP1s, these DTE cars. So, uh, it might be settling down for us, but it's not settling down on track at all. Yeah, I don't think so at all. Should note that right now on lap 11 is the LMP1 leader, which means Evener is into the pits. So the 848 ducks his way into the lane for his fuel. While he probably watches to the left and thinks, what is Hag and Lang doing, who both went into the sand as he entered the pit lane for the Fort Chicane? And now we need to keep an eye, like you said a little bit earlier on, Justin. Uh, the car choices, we saw it with the big 24-hour race. What's the pit stop sequence and pit stop time going to be like for these guys? You know, a, a few seconds was big in the 24, but in such a, a short race for these guys, that's going to be a, a huge, huge gap for these guys to try to overcome. There's not a long time. Oh, and then Ebner, he misses his pits. That's going to sort of compound the issue, but we'll compare here as they work down the pit road and... Pit, first pit stop sequence happens. 
see which one of these cars is quickest in the pit lane. Oh, oh and, and Ethan misses the box as well. Finally in the box is Hayward. I think he took more time trying to find the stall. I thought he was nearly going to miss it. I thought he was going to say hello to the pace car instead. As he's going to get passed on by by Evener with that pit stop. He is still up on the jacks. Hayward is off and away. Five so seconds. a costly mistake. Yeah, five seconds the difference now. Yeah, so five seconds of difference. They both sort of missed their box, so they both kind of end up sort of equivalent for the, in that regard, but five seconds quicker is the Audi on pit road. Uh, so that's gonna be that's gonna be considerable. The gap was about 10 seconds though before that pit stop cycle. So because of that, we see Pascal main the lead. So the Audis need to find a little bit of pace here, Justin, to keep up with that 848 and really push that pit stop advantage. And, I'm, and it looks like Hayward with that to decide to again to follow the leaders. It might have been a bit of an early pit, maybe two for the 332, but however, Randy, he was in clean air much of that second half, second half of the run after the spin. Yeah, a huge chunk of the field was really out there, and I don't think, it doesn't seem like we have anyone who's sort of on the alternate strategy, does it? I don't see anyone really pushing uh, John the Roberts. Safe. So John Roberts seemed to be the only one he was 45 seconds off your lead, so he's going to go an extra lap here. Uh, the only way this really works out is if he can maybe cut out a pit stop, and I don't know if that's going to be doable for him. No, I don't I don't think there's enough in this race to cut a pit stop completely out, but still, it's good oh, to see trouble, John. Richard oh. McClure. Uh -oh. Richard McClure has crashed into Indian out of Indianapolis as it looks like his blue car just couldn't stop it bobbled and weaved out through the part last year came before indy Ooh. and just head how low to the runoff yeah he's able actually to keep that out of the wall and i'm going to tell you right now that's not a that's not a stressful or a, excuse me that's not a fun uh spin to have whatsoever as you spin down there um it is uh it is quite a fun run uh not a fun ride yeah that was a good effort to make sure he didn't hit the wall but it looked like on top of that you nearly lost a second time, as you might have seen in the back end of that replay, because I think that bump over the sand just just, just destabilized the car, and it took him an extra five more seconds to get going because of it. Yeah, that's that's not going to be a... Uh, it, it, it's just so stressful as we just... We're going to rewind the cameras back here once again. Um, and there's the incident uh, to get, that, uh, get a second look at it. Um... But you're, but you're right you go through there and oh yeah you can see what you mean i've rewound the cameras again and he's still just sitting there so first time we got to look at the replay something was obviously wrong so we're right on board and the reason this isn't fun is that this is really the fastest corner on track down here at indianapolis and he just sort of I, I think he takes it a little bit too tight here you see him turn in and i think that's what happened he crossed the crown of the road clips the grass on the right hand side and then you see a big drift off into the runoff and then trying to re-enter he just Cooks up the rear tires and uh, has a little tap of the outside wall, and now he's sort of in an Austin Power situation with the uh, with the retaining wall in the racing line. You see a couple prototypes cycle through as we'll cycle back to live pictures. So we should be as seen by the way John Roberts on pit road, and indeed he is, as well as the 486. Uh, excuse me, the 848, I believe it is, behind him. Uh, so a couple cars actually on the alternate strategy, nope. but no. Nope. What do you got? Look, the 848's back in. Yeah, that was the leader. Oh, you're right. Uh, Did he get a penalty? Oh. Let me double check this because this is something we've seen actually in a charity race today where someone pit sped while exiting. And it's a tough pit lane to enter. Those yellow cones, you have to yeah, be it was a penalty at 37. Yeah, the five second stop and hold. Wow. Yeah, he was going 37 even for parts of the pit lane. But however, half the pit lane, he ran at 38 miles per hour. Yeah. So, so that might have uh, done it. Yeah, that's not going to be an ideal situation for him. But I'm going to tell you, it's an ideal situation for who's on screen right now. Ethan Haywood and his mean green pink wheeled machine. So Ethan Ivan Allen Hayward is up to the race lead for the time being. Looks like he didn't have any penalties to serve, and it has clean air now to do in that 332 machine. Next car for position back again is still the 848, even with the penalty. 
Then there's something interesting. We've seen Alex Janssen have a very early pit stop in this one so far. We've seen a couple drivers, in fact, do that exact thing where they had to come in for respect to penalties in the first couple laps, and it has really mixed up the strategy today. Yeah, I mean, it is something. I, with a 2.4 hour race, you know, going to, well, uh, you know, going two hours and 24 minutes, it is sort of an option for these guys. You're probably going to have a short stint. You may take it in the early goings of the race, but I think. Uh, I think for them, I, I don't think that's going to be much of a benefit. So those drivers who had to come down pit road to maybe serve penalties, not going to be a great uh, a great day for them. Going to be an uphill battle for sure. Yeah, and some drivers may tell you it's for strategy. But again, I don't know about the strategy for some of the teams so far today, the way it's gone so far. But uh, the interesting battle of the day so far has been that second on back grouping of the GTEs that we've been keeping up with much of the day so far. Because Challenger has actually lost the back end of Clausen's and is actually not looking the best of cars right now. He is actually slower than the top two by a tenth to three tenths a lap. Yeah, so maybe not quite having the pace does Christian. And of course, he has lost that slipstream a little bit, which has brought both B uh, David uh, Bearcloud and Hugo Preto um, into the picture a little bit. It's good to see that that big BMW out there having a good run. I know that typically balance of performance-wise around this place, it was uh, really Porsche and Ferrari favored during the big 24-hour race. So good to see a couple of BMWs actually. See another one lurking in the background there behind. That's uh, Mateus Magnussen. And actually a third BMW in line behind Mateus as well, who I think is the Alva Verde. Indeed, that is the situation before you get a big run of uh, Ferrari. So, but good to see good representation amongst the, the three GT, uh, GTE cars that we have in the sim up near the front of the field. Well, in this, in this race up at the front of the field, excuse me. And it looks like I should note here, it looks like one of the David Bakers is done, David E. Baker specifically. It looks like there was an issue with the throttle, then got some damage fixed, then had something happen with one of the Porsches. As we were fixing the technical issues, he is now done for the day, and we made it 12 laps around the track. He was as high as second at the start of this race. Well, that's definitely unfortunate for David. I will say, though, at least we weren't the only ones having hardware problems at the start of the race, but that's, that's gonna be frustrating right there for David. I've, I've had hardware problems in the past, um, during the, uh, our six-hour segment, I talked about the fact that I, I've had incidents where uh, go out there for a stint in a team race and not have any force feedback. That That is frustrating and can be difficult to deal with, but you can sort of work around it. To have your throttle only going 75%, though, there's, there's nothing you can really do uh, to work around that whatsoever. Um, you're pretty much just handicapped uh until you can get it fixed and that's basically going to be a, a day killer i mean i've done i've done indy 500 qualifying where i was locked at 98 99 percent uh throttle percent usage and that was even enough to be a huge difference of course around indianapolis flat out but uh regardless his gte fight starting to heat up hugo Prado really putting the pressure here on david barraclough yeah that bmw trying to fall on behind the two porsches it's still falling on the strip stream. However, this has been one of the faster spots to try and get the run. However, you need to be on the preferred line by the little kink before Indianapolis to make it work. So the Porsche curves now, they go towards, in fact, this time. As Chowner's trying to hold serve. It looks like though Chowner has struggled to the Porsche curves, at least from what I've seen today. And you're seeing an example of that right there. Loses time on the apex and exit each time through these quick left, through these rights and lefts of the chicane. And it just, I think, hurts him for the first part of the racetrack after the start and finish line. He might be struggling with the tires just a little bit. As you can see, Bear Cloud has been able to get a run coming up toward the Ford chicane. Not nearly enough of one to make something uh, that he can really work with, though. You see these guys all go through the second part of the Porsche chicane and down the front straightaway. The Porsche is the best GTE car typically through the Porsche curves. We saw that in the 24-hour race. Most teams sort of picked up on that in their oh, testing. Hold on one second. It got? looks like something happened to Dennis, pardon me, I Penberg, who was, had an issue on the uh, coming out of the Porsche curves and ended up losing his car after hitting the back wheels on the rumble strips and uh, maybe a piece of grass. So this would have been what last lap this would have been just 10 about 20 seconds ago 
Well, then it wasn't Porsche Curves. He's only in, in Indianapolis or right just now. No, never mind. I take that back. It was just after the Porsche Curves are passing by I the, some of the Porsche logos in the final part of it. So there's the two parts where there's the Porsche logos, that blue straight. Then there's the right. Then after the left-hander, he ended up losing control. locked up the brakes immediately and stopped the car. Got back going in the Fury SimSport machine. He just ended up heating up the back tires, I think, from it. That's about it. Yeah, that's going to be one of it. I don't think it was the, the heating up of the tires. It's a little bit of a sketchy rejoin there. He, he sort of clipped the curb at karting there, which is not something you really want to mess with and do. It can be... Uh, not great for the for the way the car is going to sit and settle and we've seen that um but regardless it's uh it's well held by him and he's going to be happy he's able to still be out there and rolling is i have to start thinking justin we have to not be far from a first round of pit stops here for the gte cars they're currently on lap 12 or excuse me lap 13. hpds are meanwhile wins so it's time to start thinking of that there is a couple gtes also mixed into the pits with them so far including Rob Gall. So the pit window is open for those drivers right now. And there is also a modified LMP1 that was in third position before the pit cycle, the 824 that's sitting there. So something's happened to the 824 that we've not seen, and that car looks heavily, heavily damaged. We'll get an eye about how long ago this was. He's been on pit road for a minute, which is a nice, easy number. So we'll rewind these cameras back and we'll see what happened to the driver of this 824 car Matej, and you see excellent Porsche curves. Oh, it's an incident, incident with an HPD, and I think he may have actually, either he's all tap forward or he's hit the incident limit already. Not exactly sure, but the car just sort of disappears. I'm not really sure what that HPD was doing. The Audi has sort of all right in the world to go on that left-hand side of the racetrack, and he was fully alongside. That HPD just sort of, I think, lost track of where he was. So an unfortunate incident there for Matej and really I think no fault of his own he's gonna end up losing out um, on this one as we should be expecting GTE traffic on pit road this time honestly I think he thought he was he was thinking about passing McClure maybe it was the thought process then just didn't realize how quick the car behind was coming and unfortunately that ends off a lot of the damage he does have a fast repair available However, it's going to really hurt him in the points, is the thing, as we see these drivers head towards that said window. Again, we've seen two different GTEs already come in for fuel, Randy. As you said, we might see the rest of them come down this time by, maybe, as they're on lap 13, approaching 14-ish. Yeah, I'd, I'd be surprised if they stretch it an extra, an extra lap here, but th this time, I think, surely has to be the time through for everyone. Let's see what your leader decides to do. He's going again. Well he, stand, well, he stands us corrected. Claussen's also doing that, so... And meanwhile, Baraclo is watching as Prado has just dive-bombed Schalliner, heading to the Fort Chicanes. He's gotten past both of them this lap, so that's well done by Hugo. Yeah. If we can get back a look at this for Hugo, because you're going to see this. This is right by the pit entry. Hugo Prado's got the run and ends up diving it on in with a bonsai sort of my type of move to get by Schalliner. You see here, he gets the run, and he just gets enough of a run and enough of an overlap. I think Challenger sort of helped facilitate that a little bit. It was a big dive from Hugo for sure, but I think the move was on, and that's just well held and well executed there by Mr. Pareto. Uh, you got to know when to be aggressive, and he and he really kind of made his choice there. Now he's starting to open up the gap over those two portions behind him. Going to have the slipstream maybe a little bit down the Mulsan, but he's done well to actually break that draft in the couple moments since he's uh, picked that pass up. So for Hugo at the moment, um, we'll take a look at what the gap is. Uh, about half a second, so they're still going to be feeling that slipstream, but that BMW, it's good to see him getting good pace out of that car. Indeed, so far, it looks like on top of that, we've seen the rest of the lead HPDs oh. come into pit. Oh, Hugo gets sent down to the first chicane. So Hugo Prado getting sent around in his BMW. Looks like contact from behind, as that is, yes, indeed, the case, as Christian Chowder was the one who hit him. To see what exactly happened with Christian here, maybe Prado is fuel saving a little bit. It was a big gap up near the braking zone. You're about to start seeing the brake markers on the left-hand side. 
And I think Christian just outbroke himself going in there. I mean, he had a full sort of two lengths there, two car lengths before uh, before getting a Hugo, if not more. There was more than enough space. I have a feeling that's just a mental mental error from Christian Challenger. That's the only thing I can think of. Yeah, that was a five mile per hour difference between the two of them with the with the difference in the braking markers there. Just when you have that difference of speed, momentum slash force ends up sending the car around even with just minimal damage. That's why it was just the minimal. It still sends you around and that ends up losing them a ton of positions, both of them in fact, because of the spin. Cradle falls in front of Magnuson, while Barraclo and Klaassens are also able to get by while well, Challenger cycles in behind them for the time being. Just an absolute mistake is all I can really say at that point as we discussed there. Here, but uh, again, this is right as the window for fuel is slowly closing in because they're approaching now an hour on their fuel and tires at this moment. Yeah, remember the two hour, 24 minute race and we got an hour and a half to go. So we're only six minutes off the hour mark here, the hour of racing mark here. So. These races really do tick by quickly, especially compared to the fact that we were doing six hours the other day and we were talking about drivers doing stints of three or even four hours. It's uh, two and a half seems really, really quick as you're likely going to see all your GTE leaders on pit road this time. I'd be shocked if they can go again. It's been a pretty great drive from this driver out in front, hasn't it? Pierre Garacino. It's been absolutely flawless at the moment in that Ferrari, been able to open up the gap early and just manage it well. Ethan Haywood in his uh, Audi LMP1 car is going to buzz by quickly. We've already seen him on pit road. And here comes your GTE leader as uh, Clayson's in the background struggling a little bit with the traffic, but he'll get on to pit road relatively clean. So Tim Clayson's coming in. Barracol stays out. Challenger comes in. Prato comes in. Magnuson stays out. So some slight differences in strategy here for some of the drivers as they slam the brakes to get down to 37 miles per hour and come in for their scheduled pit stops here. So Barraclo moves up to the lead for the time being. However, he does still, of course, have to come in. This How is going to be strategy, interesting. Randy, working out? Well, I'd almost think... So if he's, if he's going this extra lap, it means he's fuel saving. I don't necessarily mm -hmm. think he's going to be saving enough to be able to cut out a pit stop. Just, it, I don't, there, there's no way in the world that that's going to be a thing that happens. But even just going this extra lap should be quite considerable. I think these cars use someone in the realm of two or maybe three gallons per lap. Maybe someone in the chat can, uh, can maybe bring me up to speed of the exact fuel economy of the Porsche. But even this extra lap could be quite important in, in sort of bringing him in and keeping that gaps down. So, you know, it could be a couple seconds saved in the pit lane on each stop, and uh, I think most people are there. Most people tend to be down with uh, saving themselves five seconds over the course of a race. There were a couple differences in the pit times overall, I should note. Uh, Garacio, Garacio, I should say, 33.8 in the stall. Tim Clausen's 31 seconds. Chowner only 29 seconds. Prado was in for 30 seconds. So a little bit of variance between the top four car, top four or five cars as they had for their pit stop times. With some of them, mind you, coming in in the middle of hard traffic. Yeah, at this phase of the race, you're, you're never gonna be able to find a nice gap. Did get a nice little update though. The Ferrari, for reference, uses about, uh, uses about six liters. So that's a, uh, that's a, um, a gallon and a half. Uh, for those who are unaware, a nice, quick, sort of easy, rough uh rough translation between liters and gallons a liter is roughly a quart which is one fourth or a quarter of a gallon so that's usually a uh, a pretty good indicator i do think we have another car that's not pit as well by the way the triple three i don't know doesn't appear he's been down on pit road so you see him right now currently trying to chase down tim clausen and you see all the traffic in the background um we do have one question from miguel sanchez what are the green lights on the side of the car mean well these are uh elms style car well not elms star, uh, style cars but the moss series style cars so alms back in the day elms the old style Le Mans series they're really the ones who started this these days this is sort of being replaced by actual position boards those actually dictate 
the top three cars in class. So if you see one light on the side of the car, we'll switch over to this Audi. If you look closely on the number boards, on the left, on the, excuse me, on the side of the car, at the front of the number boards, you can see where the lights are. It's kind of hard to see on this lime green Audi because it is so dark. This Porsche, I believe they're in a slightly different location. Actually, not really sure of where at the top of my head. They're much easier to see at night. You can see them right there behind the number panel. So behind that number 38, behind the front wheel, that dictates and that's telling you that that car is second in its class. The color is red is because on the cars with the number boards, you can see uh, behind the number 38, it's a reddish color. That's how they dictate LMP1. LMP2 is blue. So you'll see blue lights there right in the middle of the side. One light is first, two lights is second, three lights is third. And then the red, uh, the green light is just because GTE these days is generally specified by the, uh, the color of green, uh, especially GTE Pro, which we don't have an AM class built into the sim. But that's what those lights mean. They're a little bit antiquated, sort of older style. We're starting to see the uh, kind of the full LED number boards start to start to really become popular in place of those uh, those sort of OG three light systems. I never actually noticed the lights on the on the number boards, honestly, before you brought that up, Randy. That's actually interesting to see that actually on the car. Right? IndyCar does the same the sort of thing with their position well, numbers yeah. at this point. That's what that's what most series are starting to switch to. This is it's sort of an antiquated system that started, God, 15 years ago with with the likes of uh, the ALMS and Le Mans. Maybe even I don't know if it goes much further than that, but I remember. Um, it's been a thing in the sim for a long time, and some of the older cars that we have on the uh, iRacing service, like the, uh, the the Corvette GT1, the Aston Martin GT1, the HPD, um, the old Ford GT2 car, uh, all of those have it, and all those cars raced way back in the day uh, before we got to the 2010s. And a couple of other drivers were able to extend an extra lap, come down pit road, um in from gte so you're gonna see sort of the the regular names start cycling back out towards the head of the field um but yeah it's sort of an older thing that uh is really starting to get replaced by like i said the the indycar style system you're starting to see uh imza uses that and uh, a lot of the teams i think even in WEC, um in the world endurance championship i don't know if it's quite official yet i'll be honest i don't watch as much wc as i used to, wec as i used to um but a lot of those cars of course run in both series or have run in both series and they they'll have the number panels on them regardless some interesting stuff for sure um this is also going to be something uh, fairly interesting for some remember alex johnson he had some issues early on in the race ducked down the lane on the second lap of the day apparently his brake pedal broke to Ooh. the where he said uh ha 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 what is this even Apparently, he might have seen that happen, too, as he was trying to stop in his stall for a scheduled stop. That is why he's off the racetrack and falling down the leaderboard and quick. Yeah, that's really frustrating as we take a look. Uh, uh, he, he mentioned that, actually, in the in-sim chat. So in the public yeah. driver chat, he mentioned it. And apparently, he, uh, he may have hydraulic-style brakes because he was worried about oil being everywhere. He got lucky and... There's no oil, there's just a bushing that's just gotten demolished, likely sitting somewhere uh, under his rig. So he'll be happy with that, not to have any um, any hydraulic fluid or anything of that nature underneath the... Uh, I, I thought he was being pedals. sarcastic. I thought he was being sarcastic at saying, oh, it's going to be on the track. I That's what I thought. Uh, for reference, what he said exactly in the sim was, let's see if there's oil everywhere now. I mean, there are hydraulic style pedals. You got to remember things like the Husingville yeah. pedals. Um, there's a couple of other brands as well. Um, yeah, I have course, one of the H Fanatec uh, ones. I think HPP is another one that kind of, yeah, Fanatec as well. Um, you know, just different kind of ranging in terms of price ranges, of course. But uh, they, they actually do have hydraulic fluid in them. So, uh, yeah, it's, um, it, it is definitely a thing that can happen. Um, uh, that, oh, trouble. Uh, oh, Tom no. Drelling has spun around. The 45th place car he had hit early in the GTEs. And appears to have been having trouble beforehand because he was smoking because he flipped in the air after leaving the Porsche curves. Well, that's not typically the way you want to take the Porsche curves. So we will ride. Oh, on and he got hit. Oh. He got hit by an HPD. That's why he got in the air. That was Hormelia who hit him. 
Well, we got a replay up on screen right now. So let's take a peek. You see that Audi, or excuse me, Porsche in the background. Don't believe that's the car that hits him, but we'll see what happens through Porsche curves. Looks relatively clean through the first segment. So where does the incident come through here? He's good through this part. Oh, he scrapes the wall actually on the right hand side. And I think that breaks the car. And then going through this long right-hander, you see him struggling with it. So what's ended up happening here is he's pushed through. Oh, and you're right, that big flip. It was a prototype, an LMP1 coming through. We'll get another replay on this with Tom Drelling. Rewind on the camera's a little bit far back, but that's okay. But you're gonna wanna watch his hands. And he may be struggling with the car already, watching him through Indianapolis. Seems he's struggling with rear grip. We'll see what happens and what it looks like coming through our notch. The car looks fairly planted there. But we'll, you know, watch what happens here. We've actually, I've actually had this happen before uh, in a team race as well. Teammate um, uh, Mike Tunison, who I think some of the people in the chat may be familiar with, uh, had a very similar incident in the, in the old Ford GT2, the very first I racing Le Mans 24. So going through this right-hander, everything's kind of okay, letting that Porsche 919 through, but it's right here. He pushes on the exit of, the, of this left-hander and he scrapes that wall. That breaks the suspension of the car and you can see him struggling with it loose all over the place. He just can't quite get it turned in nicely. He slides a little bit and well, nowhere really for that prototype to go we'll have a quick look on board with the perspective of the prototype as you'll see this was diego hormilla and you'll see what the closing speed is like you can't see that ferrari just yet but he's about to come through a very fast blind right hander and that ferrari is going to be in the racing line so not really much diego can do there but to the moon for mr tormilla and it looks like uh, Hormelia, Hormel is okay in the bottom shell motorsports machine. Excuse uh, me, for the Ferrari. To yeah. the main go, went the Ferrari. Sorry, my mind is a little bit mush today. Yeah, I'm a little surprised that Horm Hormilla had less, da not as much damage as I thought he was from that hit, from that right front. He got a bit of back wing damage, I think, somehow from it. And he's now going to have to go around the outside line. Uh, but... I'll be quite honest, I've never seen a situation where it, just that little type of a scrape breaks the whole suspension like that. I've heard of it in real life, never in the sim before. It's, there's not a lot of places we have on the sim where that's likely to happen. There's, you, you know, you think about the sim, most of the tracks we have that have sort of high speed chicanes or high speed S's don't have a wall right there immediately on the runoff. Another example where the wall is close is going to be Montreal with a couple places where you have fast corners that immediately lead into a wall. But most of them aren't the sort of walls that you're going to brush lightly like that. Most of them are walls that you're going to hit hard. Particularly at Montreal, you have the Wall of Champions. That's one where if you get into it, you're going to, it it's going to be a little bit more of, a, of an actual rough hit the way you sort of work through and get off of it. We saw that with, uh, uh, I believe it was Magnuson in F1 qualifying this past Saturday had a very, very similar incident uh, to that. There, though, it's sort of unique in the fact that you're going so fast, probably 120, 130 miles an hour, and when you scrape that wall, it does massive damage to the car. It might look like a scrape, but let me tell you, when you're going 130 miles an hour, nothing is as simple as a scrape when you're tracking the bits of a race car up along the wall. Absolutely, for sure. That's not a good way to gain speed in track position, is to do that. Uh, it's a good way to go to the moon. Uh, yeah, 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 it definitely is. Uh, turn yourself into a rocket ship, why don't you, I guess. Uh, uh, by, as this has all been going on, and as all the crazy has gone on, we have an hour and 18 minutes left on the clock uh, here so far. Daniel Kraft has led the whole way for the HPD so far. He's actually started to pull away from Jamie Rushworth. Uh, he's been in command since the drop of the green flag after the issue we've seen from Jerome Haig where he had to start from the pit lane for today's event. Yeah, it's been a bit of a drama-filled run in the prototypes. Uh, well, the P2 cars, hasn't it? There's really not a lot of close fights that I can see in that category. Everyone's kind of separated by about three seconds four seconds it looks like up and down the field we'll take a look at a couple other uh fights though let's take a peek at lmp1 this is between uh i believe it's pascal ebenauer and david baker somewhat decently close out there on the race track is this for a position yeah it is for a position so and i take that back it was not david baker it's trevor vavarsky my timing screen acting up just a little bit so 
ah there we go i had to push a button and it fixed it but regardless couple fights still in lmp1 which it's really lmp1 and gte that seem to have all the battles today yeah absolutely right now so far uh, it's been interesting and very curious like so far in this one so far Kravartsky currently losing two seconds though last time by to the 848 machine. Remember, the 848 had sped on pit lane last time by and was the fastest car in the class. That in turn snowballed to what we see that 21 second difference between him and Hayward on the racetrack. Here's the thing, in a longer race that's say 24 hours, even 12 hours or eight hours, that wouldn't be too much of a problem. Game that you'll be able to gain the time back up if you kept on going at a very consistent pace for about three hours. We only have 24 estimated laps to go in this race for the class. That's not a lot of time, Randy, to do anything. Well, yeah, I mean, it's this is really more of a Grand Prix. It's really the way you kind of want to think of this. A lot of people will be like, oh, but it's a sports car race. You'd really have to think of this like an Indy car race or an F1 Grand Prix or something like that because... That's about the sort of length you're talking about. Maybe a little bit longer, but you know, you're talking somewhere in the realm of about two hours for those races usually. Tack another 24 minutes onto the end of it, it really doesn't change the type of race. So you're, you're gonna be limited by a couple factors. One is the number of pit stops. You're always only gonna be making a couple stops. So because of that, any extra trip down pit road is an absolute killer. Like you said though, compared to say a 24 hour race, you know, even what we saw last time out in the 24 hour race, you know, the reason the Audis were so dominant wasn't that they were coming down pit road less often. It was only a small part of it uh, in the whole grand scheme of things. You can sort of work with a pace disadvantage over a long enough race. You can work with a strategy disadvantage over a long enough race. But here in this uh, sort of two point uh, or really two and a half hour race that we have here today, uh, you can't really do anything uh, of that of that sort. Yes, indeed. It makes it hard to, do, to figure out where you want to be, what you want to do. And remember, these drivers are on their own for the rest of the way. Let's go to a race spot fan immersion. Why don't we here on the race spot TV, the iRacing Esports Network and spin the randomizing wheel. Let's pick the ugly car. No offense to Hayward as he leads the field overall by 1.3 seconds and cuts his way through traffic in the tree lines. You're watching race spot TV, the iRacing Esports Network.
An hour and 10 minutes to go for the Le Mans 2.4 for the European region today. The major series here on Race Bond TV and iRacing Esports Network. It's been an attrition filled race for some teams and one filled with struggle. But still, some of the best teams are getting ready to come in and are pitting here today. On this racetrack, Justin Prince, Randy Chinnett, as the LMP ones are pitting and following their strategy. However, Haywood has kind of decided to take advantage of the extra lap of fuel for the Audi, has stayed out on the racetrack. He also just so happens to be the fastest car on the racetrack at the moment here on Race Spot TV and the iRacing Esports Network. So, right about cue for the LMP ones for their fuel window. They still have, with the amount of laps estimated to go, at least one more stop to go. The LMP ones are going to have to three stop this. It's going to be another full stint and then a, a short kind of fill to the end. So I think that's expected. I think that's what everyone is expecting. So everyone coming down pit road, um, cycling their way out. It's good. Definitely nice for Ethan though, because sort of the same thing we saw from Kawanda last time out for the 24, wasn't it? Um, <laughs> what saw what, uh, how we saw them dominate that race. Right now, Ethan has a pace advantage. He has a fuel advantage and he has a time to spend on pit road advantage. So uh, it's pretty much all on this uh, number 332 car. And maybe he wasted all his bad luck in terms of color choice, Justin. So maybe he'll be able to get to the end cleanly. Um, it's his uh, likely color blindness that uh, is really what's uh, downfall on him. I honestly didn't think about colorblindness being a part of that. I apologize I doubt he's colorblind. I think he probably just likes flamboyant colors. But I'm trying to I'm trying to give him an out. Uh, it's better not to assume. I'll just say that right now, um, just in case. Uh, but the strategies again is starting to get interesting. The racing, compared to the Le Mans 24 hour 24 hours, we've seen a bit more attrition actually. Not not uh, sometimes in terms of accidents, sometimes in terms of mechanical failure so far, much even more so so far. Or I think by far, because in that, in the 24 hour race, we've seen what, only a couple DNFs the entire time over 24 hours, shockingly. Yeah, I mean, there's been a, I mean, our six hour segment in particular was pretty tame. Uh, the attrition rate of that Le Mans 24 though that we just had was definitely, I think the lowest of any that I've seen in a long time. It was pretty, uh, a pretty tame race but uh yeah this one's been pretty tame as well there's not been too many crazy moments we had that one early on with uh um and sort of lmp2 car getting into an lmp1 car but besides that everything from what i've seen has been pretty calm of course we had the first couple hours that was uh, excuse me the first couple moments that were sort of uh held up by the fact that we were having some technical issues so maybe i missed something but uh other than that, things have been just sort of, I think, quietly ticking along for everyone. Well, there are then some technical issues, of course, for some of the top runners, whether it was the pedal issue for Baker or whatnot. It's been uh, fairly tame so far. We also seen Hank, of course, have to start from the pits, and he has gone up to fifth, fourth in the HBD class since then. By the way, the leader's pace right now was a 318.284 as his best lap. And he was running those, Hayward was, until he ducked down to the pit lane this time by and is up on the jacks. Oh, by well, the way, go I got from a killing time. He knows what the colors are. They begged him not to use the colors, but he didn't listen. Oh, boo. They're so boring. Run the ugly colors. It's fine. It's way more, it's way more fun to have a few people be triggered by an ugly car doing well than it is for... Uh, a decent looking car that most people will uh, end up forgetting anyways. More people will remember the ugly colors, so you fly your ugly colors proud as Ethan comes down pit road, likely taking tires, and well, he's already out and away. As a GT driver, I can never get used to how quick these cars pit. Producing is, well, our time experience says he's on pit road for nine tenths of a second, so he obviously has the fastest pit, pit crew of all time. But uh, as a GT driver doing the production work, I, I always see a car on pit road. They, oh, okay, they'll be there for about a minute, maybe 30 seconds if they're skipping. And then I just click back, and then they're just gone. Yeah, it's fairly quick, actually, those types of stops. Uh, it could be fast. It could be something else. Uh, I to, for full disclosure, I used some JRT timing to make sure where the cars were on the racetrack. I have drivers that took a tenth of a second. Stop you use Joel real timing? You cheater. Wait, how's... Uh, 
Uh, let's not get to that horse that route today, I what? guess. Uh, the A48, by the way, is on the way in eighth position. Time. Nothing's wrong with it. I'm just not sure why you it would be cheating. Oh, because that means you're having to rely on software instead of being a natural broadcasting talent. I mean, you need to know where the intervals are for the cars. You just got to be psychic I am, like I am. So, for example, I'm about to click on Jerome Hag and Eric Mickey, who are probably close on track. Um, they're not at all. The, um, on a the galactic scale, they are nose to tail. They're seven seconds apart. Yeah, on a galactic scale, that's nothing. You have any idea how, how short that gap is at light speed? The devil's in the oh. details, Justin. The devil's in the details. By the way, Hag is actually the fastest car on the track in the class for the HPDs. He is three seconds quicker than everyone else, at least in front of him, and See, he's so coming were, in quick. They were close. He's just so fast that they're not close anymore. He's about to be close to Derek Mintz, though. There you go. Uh, he is closing fast. And I mean quick. Five seconds quicker than the leader last time by working his way for the Fortune Cane. Remember, he started from the pit lane for the Devotion Sim Racing Machine. This time by the Stripe. It's a 332.485. No one else is even close to that ballpark right now. Yeah, he's, he's flying. He is just going absolutely mental. Looking through, he just did a 332.4, as Justin said. The three cars in position in front of him, the fastest of them did a 335, and it's this car he's chasing down three seconds a lap. Claude Belville is doing 34s, but yeah, right. Uh, Jer Jerome Hag is, he might have the pace to be able to rail, rein, it, rein in your leader. How far, how far back is he off nine the lead? Nine seconds. He's only nine, nine seconds. seconds off the lead. Yes, right now. All right, so and Jer might, Jerome Hag's going to win this race. If he doesn't crash, he'll win this race. If he crashes, hashtag blame Randy, hashtag I lost my bets following Randy. Uh, he is also up to third as he just drove by Mintz like he was standing still. Well, that tends to be what happens when someone's going three seconds quicker per lap. It can, uh, and your top, was actually your top couple cars are actually fighting as well. We were talking about the fact just a couple of moments yeah. ago, Justin, that, the, that they were really kind of spread out. I think there may have been some pit stop sequences or some other shenaniganry because your lead group is, well, they're nose to tail. And I remember checking in with them at some point and there wasn't really a fight happening and now there is. I was going to say, while they're about four seconds each time at the stripe, about for three quarters of the racetrack, that is down the most same straights, as well as Indianapolis, it's been nose to tail basically for Kraft and Rushworth. Rushworth just stayed behind him, saved fuel, hasn't even poked his nose out really since about 10 minutes into the race when he looked to maybe make a move. And now he's just continuing to stay on behind, but I think it's got it's about worry time pretty soon because just eight seconds back now is Hag, and he's flying, trying to break away the draft from Mintz. Yeah, you are right, but I, I don't think if you're these guys, you can worry too much. I think with his pace, I think he's always going to catch you. So I, I would keep on your strategy here. If your strategy is to save gas, I would keep with it. Um, unless you're really, really terrified. Um, but you have sort of everything going for you. You have slipstream partners here for this duo uh, compared to Hag in the background. He's going to have to catch you on sort of raw pace. And that's going to, you know, help you out a little bit as we're 45 seconds off the hour to go mark here. So for, I, I would just be calm and cool and fire these, this duo. Don't overthink it. Just keep to your strategy. And your fuel strategy will probably be what really helps you win this thing because Jerome doing what he's doing is going to be using a lot of gas. And, you know, you, you can really save a good chunk of time saving fuel around this place. Yeah, especially if you tuck up behind. That's why you see so many times... And something that, that was seen for uh, many years here. You don't want to say, be the fast, have, while being the fastest car, then say, you know what, I'll make this pass. If you're up in the top two or top three, why not just tuck in, be careful on the gas, don't even have to go full throttle. Just stay on behind and work together. Hashtag work together. To the GTEs, by the way. Uh, Garatio is still up in the lead right now with 349s in terms of pace. And he's actually pulled away from Klaassen's 
as well as Barracolo, the Torque Freak racing cars that are working together. They're not in the same Hashtag ballpark either. Together. Yes. Hashtag work together. Yeah, these two have been glued together all race, haven't they? It's, it's got to be yeah. a little... I, I don't know if it's comforting or not to know you have teammates around you. Um, uh, it's always a little... I've, I've had situations where I'm, I'm doing races like this and, you know, I have a teammate just off my nose or just behind me that I'm following. And in some ways, it's almost more stressful when it's a teammate out there because if you make a mistake and cause the incident, you know that... A, you're going to feel bad that it was your teammate, and B, if your teammates are anything like Simon Trendell and Jamie Wilson at Team Chimera, if you make a mistake, they're never going to let it let, uh, let you live it down, and they're just going to turn your uh, your misfortune into a hashtag that they'll then put on the race cars and turn into a meme for the rest of eternity. But uh, I'm not sure if that's the case of Team Torque Freak, so maybe they're a little bit, uh, a little bit easier to, to work with here as you see him work through actually even deep, different branding going across the window banner i like the way they differentiate their cars though with the paint schemes very similar paint schemes especially when you look at them head on but there are a couple notable di differences when you sort of pull along the side uh, uh when they kind of sweep across one looks one is completely blue from the background the other one orange and the white and yellow bits on the side of the i believe it's the bear cloud car um it's actually very well done for differentiating team cars yeah, some drivers they like to have their own personal covers with their specific teams. Some drivers have their own sponsors that they bring with them, in fact, act with their teams where they have to still, in some cases, follow their own template, yeah. But they have the ability to customize a little bit to be able to have that flexibility with their sponsors as Barraclo loses a bunch of time and nearly ran off the racetrack as he lets by some traffic. Lost about a half a truck car length that time by down the front stretch after heading towards the sand trap, but under an hour to go on the clock right now, and we see some of the different classes pitting. The HPDs do have some of the back part of the drivers pinning inside the lane right now. They're getting close towards their window, if my estimations were correct, if I remember correctly, are correct. Yeah, a couple pit stops potentially closing up. Um... Remember, the, those classes that it, we're thinking are going to have to do another stop, they actually may be pitting somewhat soon-ish, yeah. but uh, I don't think it's going to be too crazy. Um, if I'm estimating right, later, go ahead. If I'm estimating right, pardon me, the HPDs, it's about seven laps for the eight for the LMP ones right now. Of course, we've seen the pit stops just about a couple laps ago. They're going to have until about the 30-ish. Actually, yeah, we're about 20 minute minutes mark. away still, aren't we? Because yeah. the HPDs are only midway through their stint. The LMP ones just hit pit road, and the uh, GTE cars. Made it, it's it's going to depend. Yeah, it's going to depend. Those cars that went 13 laps. We'll be down this in a couple laps time. We're right now we're working lap 23. Those who weren't 14 laps, it's really about five laps to go, which is bulk of 20 minutes, really. By the way, with the Torque Freak cars, they've switched spots. Barraclo has swapped spots with Clausen to now help Clausen's fuel strategy situation. They're actually Hashtag keeping a fairly decent distance out. Uh, yeah, uh, between them and Hugo Preto as they've been doing that as well. This is, and they've also taken away from Challenger. This is pretty much the fastest way to get around these sorts of racetracks. These tracks where you have a lot of speed is to, uh, if you can sort of go nose to tail, um, whenever that second car gets a run, basically the lead car just lets them through and they cycle back. You see a little bit of a mistake from the lead car that might prompt another swap here going down in towards Indianapolis. But this is really how you go fast and how you work together at these places. It's not necessarily just sticking nose to tail and may not even be just purely fuel strategy as you see though maybe there's a little bit of fuel strategy there because i think i would have liked to seen uh i think it's now clayson's who's the one in the background kind of go for it there up the inside and take the the lead spot away there um but you see there's a lot of racetracks on the sim daytona is another good example you'll just sort of leapfrog back and forth and back and forth and you know that that's a good way to push your advantage without being over aggressive uh, you also see it as well, actually, in the Indy car. That's a very fast way to get around a lot of the racetracks. Indianapolis is really the, the prime example. Just sort of, if you're leading, if you're lead car and you have the second place car in line behind you, just sort of every couple laps, that second place car should be able to get enough of a run. You see a lot of traffic working through here in towards Porsche curves. This is not going to be fun to deal with, but 
looks like everyone is going to be able to manage it um every time that second car sort of gets a run work with them and let them have it that is typically the quickest way to get around this place so that triple five car a little bit dirty uh i guess you could yeah it sorry the point went off somewhere to narnia at this point pardon me but uh yeah it's getting interesting with these drivers it's okay now. The it's, only... it's okay justin we're race box commentators we don't do well at getting to the point so uh i'm not i'm just going to Ooh, uh, that's not a great line for bear cloud through the ford chicane though um, yeah he struggled to get to the apex the line through there was if anything a bit like a race bot commentator trying to make an observation on the broadcast yeah just i think he of... missed the first part of the apex randy and then tried to rebound and ended up hitting the curves and that bounced him off the track that's the second time he's had a struggle out of that of the four chicanes well yeah his racing line was like one of our sentences he, he went into it a little bit too confident and then he sort of missed the first part of it, and then, you know, at that point, he's sort of like, oh, well, maybe I can salvage this, and then it just runs off into the distance, and at that point, you know, you just lost. He's lost a position, us as commentators, we lose the viewers. Okay. So either way, uh, he that's gets the least Hugo stay with into the fight, though. Yeah, that's the bright side. Hugo's saying, you know, sitting here licking his chops and thinking possibly I can jump by this I can draft now because he was out of the reach of the draft before that mistake and remember, you can see it too with the late break remember what I said earlier about being nose to tail as a teammate and then you make a mistake that kind of messes you and your teammate over it's basically yeah. exactly what he's done He's made, and then a, you start. He's, made, yeah, he's made a mistake that's inadvertently affected his teammate because now they have a very, very big BMW M8 and they have a very aggressive Brazilian, uh, excuse me, a Barrican. Why did I think Hugo Prado was, I don't know why I did, that's beside the point. But they have a very aggressive uh, Iberican behind the wheel of that 921 car that I think is going to be all over them. I think you're thinking about Hugo Luis. No, it's a Luis. different Hugo I'm thinking of. Okay. I could also you, have just thought Hugo was Brazilian all this time, and I could also be dumb, which is very likely. I'm just going to focus on race car, I guess you can say. Uh, let's go back onto the highway, shall we, as they drive out towards the Indianapolis portion of the racetrack. Class ends and Baraclo still knows the tail. Prado has actually lost the draft since that late breaking where he lost a lot of time in the apex trying to balance back the race car. So he's dropped back and fell, fallen back out of the slipstream. And Hugo's struggling a little bit as well. That, that BMW really showing the fact that it doesn't really have great pace around here. Uh, he, he's sort of already starting to see he can kind of is dropping back a little bit He's trying to stay though as close as he can in that Samsung car On the run-up to or not. He's gonna work the brakes here. He closes nicely on the brakes, but the BMW is what I understand It just really doesn't do anything particularly well around this place. The Porsche was It's sort of the best through the Porsche S's and the Ferrari is the quickest down the straights. The BMW is just From everything I've kind of heard kind of meh in terms of BOP uh, working around this this track and I think that's what we're seeing right now is the gap I think still continues to grow just a little bit in that Odox car correct me if I'm wrong there was a BR there was a, bar, a BOP adjustment as part of the iRacing's new build along with the temperature sensitivity as well as uh, a few I other think things maybe a little bit but I don't think it was anything crazy what I think is is more important out of the two is one we've seen the track temperature since we dropped the green flag drop 13 degrees two as part of those adjustments it did a change how the track is affected by the clouds up in the sky because if you remember on some tracks randy we'd see temperature swings with that with that uh, temperature gun be as much as 10 degrees by one cloud being over the whole circuit now it's supposed to be not as sensitive we've seen in the charity race for example the temperature when a cloud was over the track only changed like a couple degrees over the whole time. Yeah, it's it's good to see that um, definitely come through. It is always, of course, important to remember that a cloud won't necessarily impact the entirety of the racetrack at once. It is possible to get cloud covers in one place other than another. We'll say, though, Hugo's been able to bring that gap back down. So 
He's found some pace through the early part of the lap here. Be interesting to see if he can keep it up as we head down the Mulsanne. But, but yeah, they've made some slight adjustments there that's gonna really affect how the cars handle and really how the, uh, the tires develop over a run. He has actually got a nice run here. He may be thinking of a move down in toward the first chicane, trying to split the teammates, and he's gonna peek to the outside. But of course, the two Torque Freak teammates are gonna give each other slipstream, and that'll help the Porsche on the left-hand side of your screen be able to maintain the position. So Hugo's gonna have to come from really far back, but Still able to get in line, though, was that car of David Baraclau. Right, Otak's back in the line. He actually got off the gas early to make sure he got to single file before that corner. But he still is within the draft of Baraclau now as they work their way down the Mosane straight once more. Again, this is the battle involving 31st, 32nd, and 33rd overall. We're following along. There is the, right, the left to right hand chicane coming up. Prado takes a peek, tucks back in, stays behind, and stays within reach of Eric Lowe. They do have lap traffic, though, coming up. It's Thomas Peterson in an HBD that could break up this if they reach him, at, if the, he reaches them at the right place at the right time to help the torque free cars. It doesn't look like they will reach him in time to affect the most sane corner. He is staying back until the exit of the corner, the HPD is. Yeah, and if definitely seems like what he's doing he's going to close up here on Mulsan and then we should see that LMP2 car just get a little bit of a run and indeed he's going to get it he'll pull out to right hand side here on the BMW should be able to swing by all three through this right hander you don't have to apex the second one in line bear cloud a little bit wide maybe not liking running that groove but HPD able to hot fall three, but these guys all nose to tail, and Hugo wants to provide the pressure going into Indianapolis. Can he get them both going into here? No, but he's going to separate the two teammates. Well done there by Prado. Very well done indeed that time. Baraclo trying to stick behind his teammates, seen the run by the BMW, and I think just went towards the middle trying to follow the draft, but the BMW took the preferred line, was able to make that pass now is lined up right behind the other torque freak machine as we were discussing all this some of the hpd cars at the back half of the field are ducking into the pits as well as one or two of the gtes so the fuel window is opening up for some of the cars on the track michael lane amongst them we need a replay of that pass we saw from hugo prado down in towards indianapolis pretty much perfectly executed for that end of the racetrack and now Hugo's got to go to work on reeling in Tim Clayson's for that second spot as they work through karting. I will say that this is, a, I think, a little bit early for the LMP2 cars here, Justin. You know, it may be, they may be feel limited to a certain extent in terms of this is, you know, as far as they can go. But I don't think they can make it to the end from here for those cars that are coming down pit road. Yeah, the motor, trying to double check the exact stint lengths for some of these drivers that are ducking down. They've gone 13 laps. There's an estimated 14 to go for the HPD, so it's going to be close. That's all I can really say based on the numbers right now. It's going to be close. However, the max we've seen is that 15 laps if you do tuck in behind somebody. Likely seen the top two in the class do for the HPDs. Yeah, I'm going to do a little bit of math here just to sort of see. Because let's see, they're doing about 13 laps and they're doing what? Roughly three point three and a half minute lap times. We'll sort of just guesstimate. Uh, for, for the cars that have ducked down 343 to 334, it's a been a very mixed bag for FIP on back tonight. We'll just say times 14. We'll just hit that. That's about 49 minutes. So if you can, you can sort of hit that if you're able to stretch 14 laps, I think you can hit the number. Uh, it's gonna be tight though, regardless. As David Baker will put it, need the extra lap to avoid the splash and dash situation. Well, there you go. Uh, so in, in your theory, does that actually give them that number? Uh, looks like it. It appears maybe so, but it will still, I think, be close here. At this point, we'll have to see how it again works out. Uh, something I just noticed, Hag has actually dropped back. And, and I think it's by a big margin. Yeah, it's, he's behind by 50 seconds now to first. Just double checking, I believe so. 
Yeah, he would have came down pit road because his yes, his lap twenty. He was amongst that group. Yeah, so he's come down pit road. Doesn't look like he can make it to the end then. So remember when I said he's going to win this race? That might be a big F to pay respect. However, you can, of course, as their drivers are very much liking to note. Again, we've seen 15 laps doable. We've seen 14 laps by some of the teams. You can do that if you lift and coast, as in save fuel when you're on your own. That's the only thing you can really do is lift and coast. I don't know if you would hold in the clutch as well on top of that in terms of a NASCAR sort of style, but it, there are ways to save to get to that extra lap. Yeah. You could sacrifice time though. Yeah, lifting and coasting is, is definitely big around this place because there's so many points on the racetrack where because you have such high speed, you can really help carry your momentum into the corner. Do it at all the Molson chicanes. You do it into the, the Molson corner. Do it into Indianapolis. You can even do it into Arnage. Uh, on the run into the Fort Chicanes is a great place to, to really feel safe. Even the Fort Chicanes in general, you can sort of change how you take the corner to sort of help help yourself save fuel. You may actually, you know, hit that corner a little bit harder to be able to coast between that first and second one and really do the whole stretch of it without touching the throttle until you're on the exit. So there's a lot of places where you can really work with the car and really make yourself uh, and help yourself save fuel. It's gonna be tight though, I think for Jerome Hag, and if he's gonna be able to make that work, of course, with him having to start on pit road, it may just entirely be just in a situation where he knows he's putting himself at a fuel disadvantage and he's just gonna drive the wheels off of it to try to get himself as far up the order as he can on pure pace, because to a certain extent, that's how he has to do a huge amount of this. Yeah, he might, I think that the advantage and gap rather had also evened out because of the cold and clo the clutch and coast and lift and throw, lift and coast strategy that we just seen there. But uh, right now we're getting close to some of the other drivers in that class potentially having to come in. Daniel Kraft is still on the racetrack. Jamie Rushworth has actually dropped back trying to save some fuel by a decent amount, dropping to the 336s and losing two tenths last time by. See if Kraft decides to duck his way in as they go underneath some of the advertising boards and towards that final Ford chicane. He's towards the right side. Yes, indeed. He comes in. He is safe for fuel and can go full out from here with 12 estimated laps to go for the leader for the class. Rushworth will also follow his way in. Yep, so your top two in class come down pit road. Where's Jerome Hag going to be? He's only at Indianapolis right now, so Jerome's actually quite a ways back. Uh, as these guys rolled their way up through now and towards their pit box. So we'll see when they actually come to a stop and we will monitor the pit stop time here for your LMP leaders. In the box is Daniel Kraft as that timer begins to count down. Let's just check back in on Jerome Hag running through the Porsche curves. He may be a little bit too far back. It's only about another 20 seconds. I think we're expecting Daniel Kraft to probably spend on pit road if Jerome Hag's pit stop was anything to go off of. Watch for about 30 seconds, maybe even a little bit less, 26, 27, potentially if he thinks he can short fill, but probably gonna fill it up to be safe. Let's see how much does he fill it up. 31.2 seconds is the time stopped on pit road for Daniel Kraft. Jamie R Rushworth will be off in a few seconds as well. Where is Hag? He comes off the Ford chicane. He's not going to pick up the lead before he exits pit road, but he will cycle in the second wheel, Jerome Hag, and he will not be far off the back of the 476 of Daniel Kraft. Yeah, he actually passes Rushworth, yes, to move up to second. Robert Lundgren is meanwhile in front, round in front of them. That will slow him down. That was in front of the HB2, of the P2 leader, and he lost it trying to go to the bottom as the car came out of the pits. Yeah, he just sort of overcooked the entry into Dunlop, just went way too fast, tried to hold it, and uh, ended up just spinning there onto the runoff. Kind of a classic Dunlop corner mistake there when dealing with traffic, but now the race is on in LMP2 because it's sort of an impossible situation for Jerome Hag, isn't it? He has to rein in a margin while saving fuel in order to not have, be able to come down pit road one last time. So for Jerome Hag, he's gotten his way up to second. It's going to be a big ask for him to get much closer, though. Let's check back in with that GTE fight. Oh, hey, look, they have a huge gaggle of traffic as Prado is applying the pressure on the run in towards Indianapolis on Clayson's, and Tim Clayson's is off wide. And it's getting nuts because Hayward also runs through. Prado checks up 
Lassens holds on to the preferred line as Hayward runs the outside rumble strips. Here comes the next position for them. It is Christopher Morneau who has been able to keep within reach of that green and pink car. He's actually faster down the straight because of that exit. So the HP for the LMP1 lead, it's getting tight. That battle between Colossians and Prado is getting very dicey. Everything is heating up all of a sudden with 40 minutes to go. Yeah, so things tight at the, the head of LMP1. I just want to keep an eye on this GTE fight as well because Hugo's really putting the pressure here on Tim Clayson. He's showing the nose in a couple places, and he, he, we know that he's willing to be aggressive. Is Hugo Prado on the run out of Porsche third, though? It's not great. Let's see if anyone's thinking about coming down pit road. They are within the pit stop window. Clayson's doesn't. Hugo Prado decides he wants out of the battle, and he's going to let the teammates work together. That's a bit of a risky call, I think, to let them hook, by up, hook back up and slip stream around this place. But maybe Hugo a little bit feel limited as he works down onto the lane. And on top of that, he might have felt maybe he was faster than the two Torque Freak racing cars. And if this undercut works, this might be a way for him in, once he gets out of the pits, if he gets lucky, to get away from them and be in front of them after they pit. It's definitely a possibility. You're likely going to see fuel only here. I don't know if you don't think there's going to be much in it in terms of taking tires. It's going to be mostly a full stop, though, for this GTE car, maybe a little bit closer to about three quarter fill just to be safe. But let's see what happens with the 921 of Hugo Prado. About 30 seconds or so of the full fuel loop, and he's going to go to 25.7 seconds on the fuel. So no tires for Hugo, and that big BMW M8 is going to be back out and rolling here in just a moment. It's checking back in with the LMP2 fight. Let's see what's the gap between Kraft and Hag. 2.7 seconds currently the gap between your top two in class. As the gap for the race lead in LMP1 is also close, that's within a second. Christoph Morau has found a ton of speed. And Morau looking to gain time. They've made some stops already two times apiece. Separated by two tenths of a second. Hayward using the right sideline. Morno waiting behind as they arc their way into the left hand chicane. Down the most same straight and head towards the most same corner here. It looks like though the way the pace is running, Hayward quick in the straights, but Morno much more quicker with the draft as well as on his corner launch on the exit in his machine. It could be interesting because Morno has been within reaching distance for part of the way through the end of the pit windows. And now it looks like this is the closest he's been to Hayward since the spin. Yeah, Morrow I think is closing right. in. I think you're right. I don't know what's happened to Hayward. Uh, because he's just sort of lost the pace. Last couple laps, he's been three seconds slower per lap than that Porsche that's chasing him down. Maybe he's, he's sort of cutting into a bit of hardcore fuel save in the last couple moments, trying to get to the end of this race. Not really sure, but regardless, we've seen this big, bright green Audi go from being in a dominant position this race to suddenly seeming a little bit fragile and a little bit, uh, let's say, exposed somewhat um, in regards to this final sort of or I guess penultimate stint. There's still a couple laps off the pit, pit uh, stop window, but you could probably come down pit road at any point here and be able to make it to the end. So if you're Haywood, do you maybe stop just to get the pressure off of you and be able to log laps all by yourself? Would you do that? Maybe it's going to be something that you have to consider. Of course, you got to remember, you come down pit road, you're going to make the car heavy with fuel. As Haywood a little bit wide through Porsche curves, that might get him a slowdown. So the Audi definitely pushing the pace a little bit. Here comes the run, and I thought there may have been a duck onto the pit lane, but no, there's not. So here are the closing stages, Justin. The middle stages of this race were kind of a slow burner, but we have class lead races heating up in all three classes. LMP1 is close. Jerome Hag still chases down Daniel Kraft. He's wheeled, reeled him in by a second since we last checked in. It's getting very intense. We also seen the 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 LMP1s change positions for third where Wolf take, took the spot on Ambus as we follow along with the HP D class difference right now. Hag is closing in. He's still on the other end of the straightaway, basically, between the positions. By two seconds is the gap. However, Kraft, of course, coming off that pit stop window, was a um, 4 minute 28 seconds. 
Compare oh, that to Hag out to the Tim lane, Clayson. 426. Something's happened to Tim Clayson's. Him and his teammate at David Barraclaw are separated, and there's wing damage on Tim Clayson's car. This is going to affect that group. What has happened to Tim Clayson's in the 451? You can see that the wing is bent. It's Indy. It's Indianapolis. He missed the corner. I think it, no, it happened before Indianapolis. It happened down in the second chicane. He did it all by himself. He clipped the curve, running off wide on the exit, did the 451. We'll ride on board with him of Tim Clayson's. You can see in the rear view camera on the dash. His teammate all over the back of him, but nowhere close enough to make an incident of it. Watch the left-hand side of the car. He'll push wide. He'll clip that curve high center of the car, and that throws him into the guardrail. So that's going to remove the team dynamic for this fight in GTE. He will take the reset and be able to get back out on the racetrack, but he will, he'll be separated from David Barraclough compared to what he was before. And on top of that, there was that situation in Indianapolis where I seen that after, where it looked like that damage caused him a struggle to turn right into the Indianapolis corner and got absolutely oh, scored. Morrow's wide, wide at the Molson corner, and that's going to give Haywood a huge amount of time. It's getting very tight between the top two drivers right now, as this is going to get nuts right now. Right now, Hayward still trying to pull some time on Mortal. They are separated. There was some differences in some of the pit strategies in this race today so far. As it's getting more and more tight with the pure motorsport driver catching up to the back end. Lost some time, in fact. Towards the back end and overcooking it is Morrow. Morrow nearly hitting the safer barrier. We're going to look at this one. We sort of missed it. Was checking back in with that GTE group as... In towards Indianapolis, he's in the middle of the racetrack, which you do not want to see. So he's not driving the best right now with Moro. And in towards Arnage, once again, he just misses the braking zone. So something's going on now with that Porsche. We've seen the Audi start to struggle for pace. And now I think Moro, he was so focused, I think, Justin, on really pushing his way forward up to that car in front of him. He made one mistake at Mulsan, and I think it's just sort of compounded and sort of turned that into another unforced air down there at Arnage. And now that 3-3-2 has an absolutely enormous margin as the Porsche is going to hit pit road. So we're seeing pit stops once again. It looks like some of the drivers on top of that for the GTEs are also ducking in as this is all going on. Moro all into the lane following Peter Balasio from the HPD class. Third place and fourth place also falling in the second place driver. So there's that fuel difference from Hayward that he is trying to take advantage of. Again, it also takes less time to fill the car for the 332 machine. This is going to get interesting for the strategy from here on out to see if, if Hayward can take advantage. And leading your LMP2 field, Daniel Kraft has a very large number 678 Honda Performance Development prototype driven by Jerome Hag in the rear view mirror. Jerome is all over the back of Daniel. Now the question is though, Justin, is does Jerome, is Jerome aware of the fuel situation and the fact that he's sort of at a disadvantage? We know he has the pace, but now that he's tucked underneath Daniel, he could go into super hard fuel save mode here and I think potentially save the fuel that he needs to get. It'll have to be a really, really big ask from himself, and it'll have to be insane fuel savings to the end of the race, but I think that's the only way he can potentially win this. Yeah, this is going to get interesting if he is going to do what he decides to do if he tries to pass or tries to go for the left and coast. Stays behind to the Porsche curbs right now as they work their way over top one of the highway tunnels and work their way through the next right and left towards the pit entry lane again these drivers already have ducked down the pit craft separated by four car lanes in front of Haig as they pass along the one second quicker last time by was Haig and that was in part with traffic and part with that strategy they do have inner class lap traffic ahead Lonnie Finch and the GTE leader and Pierre here Gordon Racino are all in front at this moment and basically at this point, if you're Dan, do you let him pass? Because if that is indeed the case, and this is a great point by David Baker, do you let him pass so he can't save? Uh, I don't know if you do or not. It's sort of a, it, it's sort of catch 22, I think. Um, 
because I think that I think that Jerome's gonna go into hyper fuel save mode regardless. And actually, I think that their GTE leader he had to spin down yes. on the double off chicane, and he oh. tried to re-enter nearly a big incident, and he will lose the race lead to David Baraclow. So what happened there? He. It looks like at least that he just lost it. He did clip a touch of the grass before arcing it in for the left-hander, then locked it up. But that that re-entry was one of the most dangerous I've seen of the day. And I think that was on his second lap post pit stop, I believe. And it's actually really odd. He had a slowdown after coming through the Dunlop chicane. And I think he sort of freaked out because of that, like, oh no, I'm giving up time. So he basically two unforced air there, airs there. And that really equates to basically two spins. If you account for the slowdown that was served at turn one and turn two, and the spin that then happened in the following sector. So huge issues for that Ferrari. And it's gonna be the torque free uh, Porsche of David Baraclow in the triple five now in the race lead and the 921 of Hugo Preto will be fighting him for second. Mateus Magnuson, by the way, is currently your race leader, but he owes us a pit stop. I think Baraclaw is also technically in that group and as well if my count is correct for the 555 machine. And if remember, Preto was a part of the undercut strategy to try and gain time on some of those cars. So all of a sudden, Strategy falling apart of Prado's actually on the back door of Baraclo right now and closing just within reach of the draft down the straightaway, but having to deal with Jamie Rushworth in terms of traffic. How are we going to possibly keep up with this, Justin, if it keeps like this for the last hour? We have three lead battles in all three classes with 28 minutes to go. A couple of them we are expecting they're going to have to come down pit road and pit at least one more time. Well, actually, take the back. A couple of them. One oh, and Hayward just, he's still on the track and just nearly lo just lost himself an extra second and a half because he just missed part of the chicane. We'll get a replay on this of what happened to, the, to Ethan Haywood. See him dealing with that big BMW. And I think you're right. He just sort of cuts it a little bit, loses about a second, second and a half. Not going to be a great run onto the straight either for Haywood. So... That's going to lose him some time as well. Remember, we saw Moro have problems, so it's still advantage Haywood, and not to mention the fact that we're expecting Ethan to have a slightly shorter fuel stint, so it really is all pressure on the 686 car. What's happened between Jerome Hag and LMP2, by the way? He still sits there in the rear view of Daniel Kraft, so he's just sitting there and just saving as much fuel as he can at the moment is that 678 machine. Still tucking in line, and this is to be expected to try and save that fuel because, again, it's a bit of a stretch with the 14. He can still lift and close. We've still seen 15 when you do 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 exactly what Jerome Haig has been doing here. When do you when do you think Haig is going to say, you know what, I got the green light. Let's make this move as he passes on by Mateus Magnuson, who is ducked in. He's going to wait. Mateus Magnuson, of course, like we said, you're at the time GTE class leader, but that's gonna change um, in just a moment, of course. I think if you're Hag, you wait until really, really late in this race, knowing what situation you're in in the fuel strategy. Jerome really hasn't been in a situation that he could save gas all race long. So because of that, I don't think that there's any way he's gonna be able to uh, really be able to get out there and clean air if he does so early and then be able to maintain the lead and save the gas. So. I think if you're Jerome, you just sit in this slipstream and you just wait. Probably, I'd say two to go would be my green light. They have an estimated about, give or take, seven laps to go. By the way, with that, Baraclo is on what would be, he came in on lap 29. So he has already had his stop. He is the leader for the GTEs, the net leader. With that pit stop by Magnuson, Preto second with Pierre Garaciano with his mistake dropping to third. So it's gonna to be tough for Baraclo now because he's the one that doesn't have damage from Torque Freak. He'll also have to re react to Rob Gall, inner class traffic who is in front of them in six seconds off the pace. And the question as well has to be Justin is, Pierre is, is dropped back, but he's not an unobtainable margin back. He's only back, what, about four seconds? I think five from Hugo Prado. We know that Ferrari has pace around here, and I think it's actually the quickest car around this place. I know there's been some BOP adjustments as they're nearly three abreast for your race lead as they're dealing with lot traffic. Here comes Hugo Prado 
on David Baraclout, and this could really help the gap for that third place running Ferrari as well. As they go into the second chicane, if these two are gonna fight, that's gonna bring uh, that third place car into it for sure. Baraclout able to hold off the assault from Hugo at the moment as Veracloud more than willing to run over the same bit of curbing that killed his teammate, but that brought in Pierre just a little bit. Let's see what the margin is now after that. Seven tenths of a second is what that Ferrari found, and we know that Ferrari has the legs down the straights. And a bit of a pull now coming from the BMW in second position as they stay back. Late break, saying hello to the back bumper, taking the exit off towards the sand. That Ferrari, meanwhile, just had a let by two HPDs of Mintz and Mick that are for position. So that's gone on by. It's becoming a cracker of a finish right now. Hayward, by the way, is up in the lead for the, for the LMP1s by 18 seconds, the gap at the moment. See, so that's absolutely huge. He would have already come down pit road then, correct? So yeah, he served his pit stop already. It yes, seems he to did. Look like. So 18 seconds, we were thinking we were gonna have three gaps in class for uh, class wins here, but that's an enormous gra gap for Christopher. And I don't think there's any way he's gonna reel that in. Jerome Hagdo still knows to tail with Daniel Kraft. That gap's not opened up at all. And this gap is not opened up either. Hugo has a bit of a run. Is he really gonna try the outside? The Porsche curve, he's gonna try to work the cutback. Baraclau, I think maybe blocking a little bit. That was a bit of a reactionary move, I feel. Hugo's gonna try to make it stick around the outside. And he oh. gets it. Baraclau, there's contact. And I think Baraclau made a mistake. That's gonna allow Pierre back into your GTE race lead. And there's cars stopped all over the entry to Porsche curves. Yes, indeed, it was a mistake by Baraclo. He got loose on the right side of the racetrack, trying to hold the speed and make it stick, but he hooked it around, saved it, overcorrected, hit the door of the BMW, spinning both of the cars in first and second place out and putting Pierre back at the point. How about that? Getting a look at the replay, we rode on board for the start of it with Hugo, and you can't really see what happened, but going down the straight, I have to say, I think David Baraclau was being a little bit over aggressive on the block. We'll ride it on board with him this time and watch the hands as he comes out of our dodge. He's gonna defend the middle of the racetrack, but he sort of leaves the ultra inside lane open after this slight little left-hand kink up here. You'll see the, the racetrack sort of bends to the left with four Porsche curves. That's where he settles kind of to the middle of the racetrack. However, Hugo, he wants to use the runoff and you see the hands a little bit just adjust. Now, what exactly happens to David through the entry of Porsche curves? Through the first right-hander, he's gonna go. He's a little bit loose just the entire time. Just a slight bite of overseer for David means that that car was just that little bit upset on the entry. And that pretty much meant that the, well, the moment he saved it, he basically just wiggled right into Hugo Prado. So an unfortunate mistake there from David Baraclau ends both of those cars day. Well, not their days, but kills both of their opportunities for the win. And I think it's going to be Pierre who's out by a huge margin. Now the question is, can Tim Clayson's reel him in? And we have another car in class. Hugo Prado has really not lost that much time. He's only a few seconds off the back of Tim Clayson. So we still have three cars potentially fighting for the win here in GTE. Gap is three seconds between Garacino and Klaassen's. Prado is seven seconds behind because of the contact. Make it down to six. This is gonna get crazy. This is gonna get even more crazy. They still only have an estimated six and a half laps around this track. That's not a lot of time whatsoever to try and react, and it's going. I think it's gonna get even more intense. I don't know if this is gonna stay because the 863 is not as quick as he was before since that spin that burned a little bit of the tires. That said, though, Tim Clayson's has not been the pacey car here thus far this race. I mean, he sat there out near the head of the field with David. Not that Tim is slow by any means, but he's not been the car that's been lighting up the lap times. So for Tim Clayson's, he's got to find something and really start pushing here. Of course, he's only would have known within the last couple, you know, half laps, suddenly he's in it for the race win. Possibly the last handful of laps, he just hasn't been pushing since we saw him that make that mistake earlier on. Now he's going to be going full set though you have to think 
in that Torque Freak Porsche, especially knowing everything that's been going on with drama with traffic and knowing that Pierre has had trouble as well. Checking back in with your LMP2 lead fight with 20 minutes left to go on the clock. And uh, Jerome Hag continues to just sit behind Daniel Kraft and sit fuel. Yes, indeed, right now, Chenault with Hayward. For those that are wondering, he did not take tires on, on this previous stop. He did on his middle stop, so it's a double stint for the LMP1 race leader. For those that are just tuning in and wondering, how is the gap 16 seconds? The difference in the pits gain, 14 total for the 332. As we still see the save from Hague, they have an estimated seven circuits around the racetrack. Well, it's all just sort of kicking off now, isn't it? We need to keep an eye on this GTE fight. LMP2 is, I think, going to be close, but I, I still don't think there's any real reason to keep an eye on it until the closing moments. Maybe a slight slowdown there from Kraft, actually, as I check in, but no, he'll be okay. But I want to see the lap times this time through for your top two in GTE. Let's see what Pierre Guricino does as he works through the Ford chicane. It's going to be a three minutes you have to predict, but what are going to be the seconds and the tenths? It's going to be a three minute 40. Actually, he's not going to register a lap time. So maybe a slowdown for Pierre, though, near the end of the lap. And he looks slow on the run in towards turn one. This is going to be a gift for P for Tim Clayson, as he's going to be about 20 miles an hour quicker on the run in towards turn one. So we don't get an official lap time for Pierre, but Tim was able to reel in a huge amount of time. The gap was about five seconds last we checked. It's now 3.3 following the slowdown. And don't forget, folks, there is one fast repair available, available for these drivers. Klassens used that fast repair. So the back wing issues we've seen from that issue out of the five, second chicane down the Mosang straight, gone. He's got a clean race car that is closing in and fairly quickly on this racetrack. Again, Klassens a 349.539 last time by. Half seconds slower. However, it is on the double stint for both the drivers for these sets of tires. As he closes on in, 177 by the houses for Grins for Gracino, 181 for Clausen's in the same section. So he is faster and closing in quick. We'll just take a peek, see if he's reeled in any time. It's two tenths that he picked up down that first stretch of the Mulsanne. And after exiting the first chicane, he's bringing the gap down again. We'll keep the gaps up as they run down. Not a great exit, though, off that second bit of chicane. He was quicker through the middle, but slower off of it. So for Tim Clayson's, that Ferrari having the slight advantage, but as he gets up to speed, I think that Porsche actually might have the legs a little bit. Pierre might be suffering a little bit of damage following that spin. You see an HPD following and cycling through on the left-hand side. Gap still stable. At about three seconds, you see it somewhat wavering a little bit through the center of the corner. He might be able to work off the back of Claude Berval for a little tidy bit of slipstream to add some speed. Berval, of course, also has to work by the GTE leader. That could potentially be a factor for some of the time. It's a ways up the road, though. It's about 15 car lengths between the HBD and that Ferrari. Bring it down to just seven with the much later brakes and much deeper run this time by. But right now, just 16 minutes and 29 seconds are on the clock. Sounds like a lot. But there's still a ways to go in technicality for these drivers and not that many circuits in total to do so. With the size of the racetrack and the times being the 319s to the 358 for a majority of the field at the moment. By the way, the HBD leaders, they're stuck in traffic. They were stuck behind Tom Drelling as well as John M. Roberts for about half the final part of the racetrack. And Jerome Hag's going to be loving this because because of the traffic, he's going to be able to get the double effect on the fuel save, not only sitting in the slipstream, but having traffic check you up kind of helps you naturally save gas because you're going to have to lift a little bit earlier. You're probably going to coast a little bit longer, maybe be a little bit more patient. There might be some times where you have to get more aggressive than you might initially want to, but for the most part, you can play patient. Tim Clayson's, though, by the way, uh, excuse me, Pierre uh, Garcino, able to get really the full effect off the draft of those prototypes that you just saw cycle through, one of which was your LMP1 leader, as Pierre is going to cycle through the Porsche curves here and uh, continue his run. I want to get an eye of what the lap times are once he cycles past pit road. 
and see if uh, Tim has a pace advantage or not. We'll take a peek at the gap, so just again, see if it's gone down. 2.8 seconds, so that 4.51 has been quicker thus far over the course of this lap. And the question is, can he get to him in time? There's no more traffic between them for now, but they do have Christopher Moreau who is closing in and quick on the both of them right now. That could potentially breeze on by this time. Looking at the official, uh, if the timing comes through, nothing official, it appears, for the 29th place overall car. But another 349.2 this time for Klaassens. That was three tenths gained this time for the Torque Freak Racing Machine. Yeah, so another big lap there. Pierre, I think because he's serving the slowdown at the start of the lap, is going to be unofficial. So we got to wait another four minutes, more or less, to get an idea of what the times actually are. Hugo Prado, by the way, really not having the speed ever since uh, that incident. He's kind of fallen off the back, 11 seconds back off of Tim Clayson. So he won't be relevant in this. Christian Challoner, by the way, who's been dominating this championship, has circulated his way back up into fourth, and he's fighting with Mateus Magnuson in fourth and fifth. David Baraclau, he sits on pit road, despite, I think, fact, uh, the fact, David, that they have the quicker pair. I think David more or less has called that quits. Maybe still waiting on the toe, but I think probably just frustrated with himself because it really was his mistake uh, with that little wiggle. Probably feels a bit guilty and a bit bad of the entire situation. I think... I think you hit upon what the issue was. Again, I look down, double check the look Actually, back. Actually, he he's recently on pit road. Yeah, because he's that's what I meant. He in the same section, David Barracol messed up going into Indy. It looked like he went off the curbs and was about to hit the tire barriers. Then what appears to be decided, you know what? Get me off this racetrack. Took that toe, it appears, and now is back going all of a sudden. Yeah, so maybe a couple issues there for David Barraclap, unfortunately, as your LMP2 leaders deal with some... Uh, GTE traffic on the run in towards Porsche curves. Let's check back in with LMP1. That gap 15.6 seconds. What was the gap last time we checked in? About 18? Yeah, 18 seconds the last time we checked in. It was 16.3 seconds at the stripe, in fact. So it's already closed in by at least 6 tenths and already half a lap for the top two. So it's closing down here for the 686 Porsche, but does he have enough time, does Moreau? Because I think there might be vali validity in the triple stint of, on the tires here, Justin. I know a lot of people are worried about sort of the, the heat, but it, you're not running three full stints here. So because of that, you can work the tires maybe a little bit easier, and you won't get the full negative effects of that second stint with the drop-off if you can save the time uh, in the pit stop. And we've seen Haywood already be willing and being able to push that advantage. A little bit of traffic for him, though, on the entry into Porsche Curse, but... That gap is coming down. I'm just questionable on whether or not it's going to come down quickly enough. It's actually a double stint once again, though, Randy, because he took Hayward actually took tires on oh, the yeah, second right. pit Excuse stop. Me. I just that's why I went back to double check as fans were asking about that because that would have been something more viable in the international split because they ran into the night. This is all in the daytime for the European split where. The track temp is going to be much more hotter compared to when they went from, say, what it is now to, say, the 60s if they were doing that at the night. Yeah, probably right about that as your GTE lead group cycles through Porsche curves. And now I'm anxious to get an idea on the lap times. We'll check the gap. Three seconds. So Pierre Garcino has actually had the advantage this last sort of trip around the racetrack. So a couple tenths, not a huge amount. It could be just lap traffic favoring the Ferrari. Run in towards the pits, though. Or in towards the, excuse me, the Ford Chicane. And let's see what the lap time is for Pierre. We've not seen an official time from him yet. And he'll cycle through the Ford Chicane or across the line. He'll do a 348.9. Tim Clayson's a 49.1. So there's pace in the Ferrari at the moment. And Tim has to find something. Yeah, he's going to have to find something, anything. A lucky rabbit's hat, a four-leaf clover, some type of pace to find hat. some extra. That, too, to no. try and find pace, find three-tenths somehow in the middle of the apexes. But you said rabbit's hat. It's a lucky rabbit's foot. I thought I said foot. No, you said hat. They come out of hats sometimes, do they not? Technically, it's the same thing-ish in uh, Winnie the Pooh logic. It's an, it's an old meme, but it checks out. 
Um, well, I don't even know how old we would be. Let's go back to race cars, please, because that's what we're all here for with 10 minutes on the clock. And right now, the gap is still 15.9 seconds for the OMP1 leaders. Daniel Kraft is still seeing Haig draft on his back end. While Garatio is still trying to gain some extra little tents here and there. The differences in approach in terms of these corners is nearly the same. However, Clausens is utilizing a bit more of the track limits to try and get some extra acceleration on these corners. Do you think that will actually help, though, to try and use that runoff area a little bit more and try and get more faster off the gas? It definitely can, but it, it can sometimes have compounding effects. Remember, we've already seen him being aggressive with the curves earlier today, and he sort of clipped one of them wrong and went for a spin. So there is some risk there, but I'll be honest, nine minutes left to go in the race. I'm going full send, and I'm using every bit of runoff. I'm being hard on the curbs. Big wiggle for Tim coming out of the second chicane. Same part of the track that he had his spin earlier and did it the exact same way, clipping the curb. So Tim's going no fear at the moment, trying to bring this gap down and in. Let's see if it's helping for him. This time through, gap is still kind of stable. About a tenth in favor of Pierre this lap, though. So Tim still, as much as he's pushing, struggling a little bit. And it could be he's pushing too hard, Justin, because we just saw him have that wiggle out of the second chicane. That would have lost him probably in the, in the realm of about two to three tenths in aggregate just for the wiggle and the run following going down the, strat, the straight. So in some regards, even though he wants to push hard and drive the car as hard as he can, he may, it may be best to back it off just a little bit to make sure you don't make those mistakes that lose you the sorts of types of time, the amount of time that you've been working so hard to pick up. You had it right on the head what was going through my head because we've seen how much he's been pushing. And each, both times, I think, with those mistakes, he hit the right side tires on the, le on the rumble strip. When I think what they've been trying to aim for, Randy, it seems, has been that middle part of the rumble strip somehow, while it be a kind of a skateboard move on it, they're trying to avoid hitting the tires on the rumble strips and actually use it to their advantage, the track portion. Both times, he hit the right side tires on the rumble strips and it bounced him around. But there's an estimated three to go for the LMP1 leaders at the moment. And Hayward has grown the gap by six tenths of a second this time. Yeah, I mean, Haywood's just in command of this race right now, isn't he? So uh, it's it's pretty much not much Moreau can do. He's basically got to pray that somehow, some way, that Audi has fuel problems or has a, uh, has a, a jumble in traffic and messes it up that way. So I think we can pretty much, I don't want to say ignore, but we, we don't need to keep an eye on that LMP1 fight as much as we were these other two. Specifically, LMP2 needs to be the one we focus on because any moment now, Jerome Hag is going to sort of hit his window where he's going to pull the trigger. Yes, so let's check in with that right now because they're working around lap traffic. That is Elvis Benello. They are working by the 39th overall place car. And now it's still within tightness. The green light segment you were talking about, Randy, when you, you give them the go for Hag at least, is this time by for the estimates because after this point, they only have under six minutes to go by the time they reach the stripe. And they take about four-ish minutes at least to get around this racetrack today. Three minutes and 30 seconds, I should say. With about three quarter, with about a quarter of the racetrack to get around. Hag staying behind, still is drafting back on Kraft. Still waiting as they get on Indianapolis. Well, they may be in a situation where they may have to go three laps because remember, it's the overall leader that dictates the end of the race. And yes. they're a full lap behind. So when the leader takes two to go here in just a couple of uh, moments, because he's, he's really not that far back, but I don't actually know if he's going to be able to get to them and lap them. They're going to have to go, of course, a full lap before they get that two to go warning. So it's essentially three laps remaining in the books for these guys when they get to start finish. So it's still a long run for them. And in some regards, experience in these sorts of races can pay off in dividends if you are familiar enough with the situation and if you know that's the situation. If you're Jerome Hag, you don't want to find yourself in a situation where you start to punch it because you think there's two laps to go and you wind up needing to go three and don't have the fuel. And we've seen that in a couple races, both official and series races, where they think the, con the white flag slash checker flag is coming out. They get the extra lap. In the case of an MX-5 race, in fact, uh, it was at Imola 
the leaders crashed on the extra lap oh, when they were think that when normally you might have seen them come to the checker flag because they had just crossed the halfway point of the racetrack to cue that extra lap. But right now, the difference between the LMP1 leader and the HPD leader, difference 318 make it 317s to 334s in terms of time. So it might be close for that range if he does reach them. He's already passed Jamie Rushworth. I think he's going to get him. I think he's going to get him. It's they're good. He's working right now through the sort of forest S's on the run towards Tetra Rouge. I think Ethan will probably get him, if not on this lap, then the lap after. And what'll end up actually happening is if that's the case, these guys end up in an actually another confusing situation. So what's really weird about this LMP2 fight is one of two things is gonna happen. They might have to go an extra lap, which they maybe didn't foresee, and that could cause issues on fuel. Or if they're expecting this fight to go another couple laps, they could actually have the reverse happen because when the leader, when the overall leader of Ethan Haywood takes that white flag, when he passes these two cars on his last lap, they will then inherit the white flag. So it's entirely possible that they could go from a situation expecting to go an extra couple laps and then suddenly get that white flag halfway around the racetrack. That said, I don't know if it'll be halfway around the racetrack as defensive as Daniel Kraft in the second chicane. Didn't seem like uh, Hag was really keen on trying to make the move, but Daniel was being really defensive up the inside just in case. You can see Haywood though, not very far back as he's working through the second chicane right now. It's going to be tight, very tight right now with 3 minutes and 30 seconds to go on the timer. Kraft holding on, Hag trying to draft, actually is lifting and coasting as he drives less harder into Indy out of Mosane as they head off down the Indianapolis straight. That actually was dead even being able to lift and coast because he wasn't as hard on the brakes and was able to keep the about the exact same speed. Let's see if he tries something here. Hag, he is trying something. He's going side by side. Moves by Kraft to the race lead. Jerome Hag with two minutes under to go. So just take through three minutes. They're going to have another lap to go, of course. Race leader has not yet taken the white, but he will jump them in the near future through our notch. And they should know that that's the LMP1 leader cycling through. Now what can Daniel Kraft do? Jerome Hag, after starting on pit road, has been the quickest car in the category. But Daniel Kraft has led a huge amount of this race. But can he make anything of this? But look at the margin that Hag has been able to open up through the run into our notch and uh, into our towards Porsche curves through Porsche curves for these guys for the second to final time LMP1 leader fully in the rear view mirrors and will be cycling through in just a moment and this is going to be very tight if they have to go an extra lap or so there's an estimated one to go for Hayward right now with two minutes and five seconds it takes three minutes and 17 seconds for the leaders to get around Hayward catches up to Kraft moves to his right side as Kraft cuts him off Tries to stay in front of Hayward, and this might get keep him in front of him for the time being, at least at the stripe. Kraft is going to let him on by. Hayward laps Kraft, and is now going to try and lap Hag as they head towards the Dunlop, cur Dunlop curb and the Dunlop bridge. He stays back, though, this time. Under 90 seconds to go on the clock for the top runners as Hayward laps his way by the HPD leader. With an estimated under a lap to go, nine tenths of a lap estimated. And let's check back in with GTE. It's been a while, and that gap has just stayed stable. They're going to have a lap and a half left to go here. They would have not seen the white flag just yet. So maybe something for Clayson's if he can reel it in. I believe he's got a teammate in the background of James Ewan cycling through. That certainly looks like a torque freak schemed car. That's exactly what it is. So maybe that Porsche will try to help him out just a little bit. I highly doubt it, though as Tim needs to find a huge amount of time here, but that gap seems pretty much done and dusted. And it's really your LMP2 fight, the only thing that's close for them with about a half a lap left to go. And that I believe was James Ewins, yes indeed. And some more people are gonna have to work around, uh, I believe a part modified, uh, the number five of the 28th position of Olivia Silvia Barrera as he's on the right side of the track. But 30 seconds left on the clock. This is going I'm still curious on how this works out though because Haig has actually pulled away and has broken the draft 
He is a full up to five mile an hour quicker entering the left hand chicane. Yeah, that car has been quick on the straights all day and maybe a little bit of an arrow difference here. You know, it is one of the things you can talk about going around this place. Uh, you can make some slight arrow adjustments, even though you typically the you know wisdom typically states get all the arrow out of the car. It's not out of the realm of possibility that maybe you kind of tick that wing up a little bit, uh, especially on the rear end, just to uh, keep it stable, especially through Porsche curves, um, because that things can get mighty dicey. But we're about to see the checkered flag in a handful of moments for your lime green leader. GTE class, by the way, is going to be taking the white flag right here, right now. Yes, indeed. White flag officially out. Hayward working his way through Indianapolis. And it's been a heck of a run. He spun once. He dropped as far back as third. He had traffic issues at one point. But in the end, was able to take advantage of some of the mistakes from other competitors. Was able to get himself back on the right strategy and pull himself away in the 332 machine. Ethan Ivan Allen Hayward and his lime green and highlighter pink machine has only a quarter of a racetrack to go. And by the time he reaches the checker flag, it would be up to 19 seconds. Second place has changed positions. Stan Ambus has just made the pass on Morrow. Morrow. But that doesn't matter because for Hayward, he'll have the fortune king to go. As he approaches the pit entry, the number 332 of Ethan Ivan Allen Hayward will come towards the checkered flag and pass one more lap car to win his way for the Le Mans 2.4 for the European region top split. Meanwhile behind Jerome Haig, he started from the pits from dead last to first. Jerome Haig wins the HBD class for Devotion Sim Racing. And what a run. A Go ahead. A heck of a drive, yeah. A heck of a drive, Randy. Yeah, heck of a drive for him being able to start from the pits. Uh, Stan Ambrose able to hold on to that spot for second in class over Christophe Moreau. Of a fight that we've completely missed out on with the way all the lead fights were developing in every single class. First time in a long time I can recall seeing that happening, but we still have one that's technically not done just yet. The gap is still wide at about three seconds. It's actually opened up closer to four. But if anything befalls Pierre, and I'm actually not sure, we're gonna do a check. These are, this is basically the last group of cars running. You have a group of cars right here and a couple in the background as well. But it's basically these guys are going to be the last couple of cars crossing the stripe. If that, if those LMP1s have any effect, that could be the difference maker. And it could be the difference maker that Tim needs. It's going to have to be that difference maker if he wants a shot here. Running towards Indianapolis. And on his own is that 863. No one around him for days. Klaassen's no one between them. It's between just the two of them hoping for a mistake. Slowly coming around the corners, the 863, the 451 machine does now have traffic. Pravorsky and Roberts along with Jonas Pateklis are all about to potentially slow him up. He moves to the left side of the racetrack and works his way with the traffic building now behind him towards the Porsche curbs. A big time advantage either way for the 863. I think it's clean sailing here potentially. I definitely think you're right. We'll have one LMP, one car to deal with. I think on the run in towards this first chicane, maybe a second one in the fourth chicane, but regardless, it should be clear for Pierre. Yes, indeed. Towards the fourth chicane he goes. One more LMP, one working behind in Trevor Pervorsky, but he will let him have his moment. Pierre Garencio will work his way to the final chicanes and take the checkered flag and win the GTE class. Second place, Tim Claussens. Third spot still up for grabs though because Challenger and Magnuson are fighting for points right on behind that for the last spot on the podium. They're about to run towards the Ford Chicane. Challenger defensive line. Magnuson hits the brakes. Can he get the run off the final corner? No. Christian Challenger comes away with a top three finish with a last lap pass on Magnuson. 
was that five fights in the last 20 minutes that suddenly just formed up? We had the Maybe lead six. in GTE. Yeah, we, there was so many fights and there's probably a couple more we missed. But man, oh man, what an end of the, this race, Justin. It was sort of a slow burner through the middle, but it really picked up at the end. And uh, Tiz did not want to relinquish, but congratulations to our class winners as we get ready to head down your post-race results. I said this during a charity race we were doing just today on Race Spot TV to raise money for for the Danish Children Cancer Society. Pardon me, the organization, the Children Cancer organization basically for that to raise about up to 10,000 plus US dollars things to pick up in the final 30 minutes to an hour of a race it did that today Randy and it did it and then some I think so far as you're gonna see on your official unofficial race results here on race spot TV the iRace and eSports Network Again, your results unofficial, pending reviews for the major series for the European region. Your top split overall winner, Ethan Ivan Allen Hayward, wins by 19 seconds over Spen Ambus and Christopher Moreau, who came away with the podium overall and for the OMP ones. Pascal Ivanor was in the lead at one point, but a speeding penalty cost him a chance for the checker flag. He came way forward. Joshua Wolf rounded out the top five with Elliot White, Diego Jimenez, Hormelia, and James Ewens. Inside the top eight, David H. Baker, John Roberts came away with top ten. Trevor Pavorsky and Travis Henderson finished the race for the class today. The drivers who finished for the HPD class today, Jerome Haig came away with the checker flag. After crafting behind Daniel Crafton, went from last to first from the pit lane in the 678 machine. James Jamie Rushworth came away with the podium in third spot. Jaron Metz came away in fourth with Eric McMichael Lang, Claude Berval, Mark Sniskanen, and Edilis Pateklis. Inside the top ten, also running the class and finishing today, Peter Balassa, along with Adam Fetsiaponte, along with Sean A. Fleming, Sylvia Millard, Thomas Peterson, Lonnie Finch, along with the modified number five, Olivia Silva Pereira, he ducked into the lane towards the white flag lap. Finishing off the race today for the GT class, it's number 863 of Pierre Goracinho, who came away in front of Tim Clausen and, and Christian Challenger. Christian Challenger was able to make the pass on Matthias Magnussen on the last lap to move into the podium and gain positions in the pro standings. Hugo Bredo rounded out the top five, Pereira Verarde in sixth from Penberg. Descends off and Benello rounded out the top 10. David Barrico, after his issues, did not come back on the racetrack. Finished 39th overall. Richard McClure and Rob Gall also finished six laps down. Tom Drelly, seven laps down in 42nd overall. Jared Morgan, Andreas Robertson, and Patrick Neese round out the class. Then there's the drivers who DNF, either via technical issues or crashes. Robert Lundgren crashed twice before he parked the car. Alex Johnson, technical issues and brake issues ended his day. A crash into the day for the 824. What David E. Baker had issues with his car, had it repaired, then crashed again. Kevin Mills had some signal issues. While well, Alexis Biebert missed the race today to round up the 51 drivers who entered today's race. We'll take a quick break on the Race Spot TV and our Racing Esports Network. We'll be back right after this. You're watching the Le Mans 2.4 for the major series European region on Race Spot TV and the iRacing Esports Network.
voice of the Lucas Oil Off-Road Racing Series. Introducing Pro 2 and Pro 4 trucks on iRacing. Game on! Welcome back to Race Spot TV and the iRacing Esport Network's coverage of the Major Series European Region, Le Mans 2.4. We've seen a heck of a race and at least six plus battles break out in the final 20 25 minutes of today's race, where we've seen Ethan Ivan, Alan Hayward, Jerome Hag, and Pierre Goracino making their way to the checker flag to win their respective classes today and try and earn themselves max points unofficially. It was a wild one today. Justin Prince, Randy Jenneth here in the broadcast booth. As let's talk to some of the drivers who are a part of the craziness here today. First was going to drag in the man who finished fifth overall and someone that had well, a quiet race was one of the top contenders at one point. Joshua Wolf joins us in the broadcast booth. Joshua, an interesting race. So it's an interesting race overall today. Uh, talk, talk us through how it went from your perspective. It was okay. Um, I think I was had the wrong um, tire pressures in the car at the beginning of the race, and that just hurt me uh, for the first couple runs, and then um, started to come in towards the end. Um, just had a little unfortunate accident with Sten um, down there at the end. And, to, and that's uh, towards the end. Uh, I'm going to guess that was in the final few minutes, correct? Yeah, um, I was looking for racing him pretty clean and uh, running, trying to get past him for third and maybe go chase down second. I think I had a car probably that could have done that, but um, I, li I like having new people in the series. Uh, it was great seeing a lot of new faces, but wish there would have been a little bit better racing 
um, on his part because I felt like I gave him enough room and he just ran into me. Oh well, uh, in terms of ev in terms of regards to everything else, because it l you mentioned wanting more of the racing part, how was the traffic management in your opinion today? Because we've seen a couple collisions with prospective classes trying to get to the traffic today. Um, it, it wasn't terrible on my, like, I know I lost some time, but I think everybody kind of just in certain spots, um, you can get really caught up behind some of the lower or slower traffic. Um, but it's definitely a big factor in what happens. Um, but I think it was, um, uh, from my aspect, I didn't really have too much of an issue with the slower traffic. It was more just issues in class. Now, overall, and though we're now moving towards the next parts of the schedule for for the major series, the next major race is June 23rd, the Detroit Grand Prix. Are we going to see you then? And if so, how are you planning to approach that race when we go back to the Indy cars? Um, you'll definitely see me. Um, and I'm going to definitely lean on some of my uh, teammates over at Torque Freak, uh, see if I can get some help on setup because I know they've been running this car a little bit more than I have and um, see if we can have another strong showing. The uh, last couple weeks have been pretty bad, but um, definitely looking forward to the next several rounds coming up. Is there anyone you want to thank before we let you go here today? I just thank our sponsors, uh, Infinity Decals, and a uh, new sponsor added to us, uh, TeamSpeak. So um, just want to thank them and uh, working with Travis and guys over at Torque Freak as well, working on this setup. Um, I hit something after our unfortunate end in the 24 hours last weekend. Um, was able to find something that gave us some pretty decent speed, just not enough for a win today. Congrats, by the way, on the top five. Thank you very much for the time, Josh. Yep, thank you, guys. That was Joshua Wolf, who came away fifth overall and in the class today. One story I want to see if we could check in one. We've seen David Barraclo at his race ended off early. David, do you have a copy? I do indeed. Uh, David, it seemed that your race ended off pretty early uh, in the final few stages of the race. You were up in the top five, and then it looked like you are heading towards the Indianapolis uh, safety road wall, and boop, poof, your car's gone. What happened? Oh yeah, at that point. Um, I had already had damage from the previous incident for, with Hugo Prado. Uh, we were battling pretty hard for the lead. Um, you probably saw that one, I guess. Yes. What, ha what, was going what happened with that battle? With because... that well, yes. I don't know if you caught much of it, but um, I had a teammate in the race, Tim, uh, Tim Clarsons, and yep. we were working together the entire race to set up for the, for the last part. Uh, we knew we didn't have the pace to match Pierre, so we hatched a plan to save as much fuel by working together and jump our way back forward towards him. He was running um, less, w well, sorry, more wing than us, um, more downforce, so we had less straight line speed. So if we we figured if we could get in range for the last stint, we we had a great chance of the win. And it was it was just working out perfect um, when Tim had a, a moment uh, spun round, and it left me on my own uh, with Hugo catching. With about uh, eight or nine laps to go, Pierre had a moment in the S's and I had the lead. Um, but Hugo caught because I had to check up to avoid avoid the incident. Hugo was catching. We were about the same pace. And with seven laps to go, I was expecting him to, you know, wait a little because we only had about five seconds gap. And anything we, we did together at that point would cost us time. But no, he went straight in uh, to try and get the track position. He was running, um, you know, a setup in a car that is just slower on paper, so I, I was keeping the track position, and uh, I decided to go around the outside of Porsche curves when we we're on old, old tires too wide, which I don't think is a smart move. And yeah, I lost it, but I'm thinking, you know, it's not exactly the smartest thing for him to do there. So unfortunately, it happens, and um, yeah, I've just got to pick up myself and, and move on and, and look forward to the next one. The next one is the Detroit Grand Prix. Um... We were, I believe we are talking to one of your teammates or, or someone affiliated part of your team, Joshua Wood, I believe, yes. Yes, yes. yes. Um, how's We heard his approach for the Detroit Grand Prix. How are you approaching that race? Because it's a tight street circuit on this service, a very tough racetrack, and one where attrition may be high with the, with the barely any runoff space, if any. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 going to be a whole new ball game, a whole different challenge to Le Mans. You have to 
build up slowly, treat it like uh, the Monaco Grand Prix, the drivers there, they, they start out really slow, build up slowly, make sure you're not making any mistakes. And during the race, it's, it's going to be about conserving really, like making sure that you don't make an, any mistakes, make sure you don't trip up over anybody else's incidents, uh, keeping an eye out, driving smart, and that way you can make it to the end. Anyone you want to thank or anything you want to add before you go today? Yeah, I mean, if Josh hasn't mentioned it already, um, I'd just like to thank uh, the rest of the Talk Freak guys. They're um, a great community. You know, we work together on, on setups for all sorts of cars, um, team racing together. Um, I couldn't do what I do. Well, we can do what we do without everyone in the team. Um, we'd also like to thank our sponsors, uh, Infinity Decals and our new sponsor, TeamSpeak. Um, yeah, they get it done for us. So uh, go out and check out those guys. And lastly, I'd like to thank uh, Tim, James and Josh for uh, for yeah doing this race, uh, having some some fun on on this one. Uh, there were some fun comments on on the team speak uh, during the race. So yeah, that was good times. Uh, so yeah, I'd like to thank them as well. Thank you very much for the time, David. Cheers, guys. Thanks for the broadcast. That was David Berkelow, who came away 11th in the class after that incident that we've seen for the battle for the race lead for the class. And. At least one more person I want to speak with here. We've seen the speed today from the 848. He was up at the front at one point, the 848. But for Pascal, pardon me if I mispronounced this, Ebener, or it seemed like a mistake came into the race with that speed penalty. What happened, Pascal, from your end? Yeah, not really sure what happened, though, because um, I was pretty sure it was uh, at the pit exit where I just got onto the pit limiter too early, and that was step and go for me in that case. How difficult was it to try and make up the time afterwards, especially with that stop and go? Uh, I was driving the wheels off the car, to be honest. Um, I mean, I got quite close at the end to the guys in front on second and third, I believe Christoph and uh, Stan, so I made the best out of, it, out of it, I believe, from, I believe, P10 or 12 after that uh, slow down, or well, stop and go, up to fourth is uh, is a good one, I believe. One thing I want to ask as well, because you were you had times in dirty air, you had times in clean air. How did the the race and the track change as you went through the different conditions, whether up front or in traffic, as the track temperature actually dipped off a cliff by the checker flag? Well. I was on on old tires, so that's that's that. It's just uh, sliding a bit more, but it was it was drivable. And um, regarding the dirty air, I had lots of problems just getting by two guys while being on the chase back to the podium that I didn't get. And uh, it's it's not fun. I gotta say it like that. You think you can just stay in the in the draft and go by, and there wasn't an opportunity where I wanted it, so you have to stay behind. Detroit Grand Prix is the next race on the schedule for the major series. Where do you, what's your take on that? Well, might see if I'm going to join in on it. I just had a message from, from Mike if I want to do the Le Mans 2.4 hours. Uh, I'm in this case just starting for this one but uh, we'll see maybe i'll go for the detroit one as well i'd have to get a setup lesson or two on the on the indy car but we'll see time will tell we'll see if you're back for the indy car anyone you want to thank before we let you go well mainly the sim racing channel guys for helping with the setup before the 24 just use the same one it worked perfectly and uh yeah mainly the guys over at SimRC. Thank you very much for the time. Congratulations on the top five. Thanks a lot. That was Pascal Ebener, who came away with the top five. Randy, your thoughts after, actually, let's bring in Jared Morgan. Pardon me, as Jared Morgan has been waiting a long, finished 43rd overall. And uh, from what I've seen, it was a roller coaster, Jared. Tell us, tell us from your perspective. Jared, yeah, you have a copy. Co Pardon me, we got you. There it is. Yeah, that was a roller coaster. Uh, I finished. Uh, how difficult was this race for today? Because I think at one point you actually got collided into. Yeah, I got 
smashed into by one of the Porsche LMP1s. I don't know what he was doing in that spot, but he was there either way, and it sent me across into the fence. I took the tow and the fast repair, came back out, and I just, well, I did what I was doing. I was just driving it and trying to make up whatever time and points I could. How difficult was it to try and make that up, though, as the race went on? Because you finished a couple laps down compared to some of the error drivers on the track. How difficult was it to try and make that time up as the race progressed and some of the trouble progressed? A lot harder than I was hoping it was going to be, but really wasn't surprised. I'm not known to be very strong here at Le Mans, but I'd still show up. Um, I made up, what is that now, uh, six spots, so that's pretty good for me, most of which were crashes. I, I did pass one guy twice. <laughs> I... I, it was either Robertson or Nice uh, who are on your same lap cycle, I believe, by the checkered flag. But uh, you are right. You did pass some people in the class. But uh, now we head off to Indianapolis, to back to Indy cars, I should say, for the next race. We're at the Detroit Grand Prix. Very tough street circuit. Are we going to see you there? What is your approach for that race compared to some of your competitors? You'll absolutely see me there. I don't miss a race in the majors anymore. Um, however, as for Belle Isle, I've never yet set tire on it. I, I think I bought it when it came out. I don't remember. So this is going to be something that I have to learn from scratch with, what is it now, a couple weeks? <laughs> uh, yes, it's on June 23rd. Oh, yeah, I'm up a creek here. <laughs> okay, anyone you want to thank before you get, you get back down the creek? <laughs> Uh, as long as I can get my paddle on the way out, uh, Josh Wolf, the team owner for Grizzly, and of course a tor Torque Freak driver, you guys know him, um, Trevor Vavrovsky, and the rest of the team back at Grizzly Evolution, and everything that they do to keep us on the track, and, well, somewhat fast anyway. That was. Thank you very much for the time, Jared. Thanks, Justin. That was Jared Morgan, came away 43rd overall today, started... Actually, technically dead last in qualifying, but still recovered a few spots on the racetrack with some of the attrition. But, uh, Randy, your final thoughts before we say goodbye. That was a pretty crazy race, wasn't it? Kind of had everything. Fantastic sort of lead fights at the end of the race. Good strategy and race spot TV uh, technical issues at the start. I don't know what else you could... That's like the trifecta, isn't it? Uh, I think the bin bingo card is just about full, just about... Yeah. I'm not sure if we got a bingo, but it's... Well, full-ish. Yeah, you, you can, you're getting close to being able to fill out like a blame Randy card with with all the with all the things this race had. You had lead fights everywhere. I mean, I think Justin and I counted as well. There was about six fights happening at the end of the race, but we were only able to really cover three of them, and we chose to pick the lead ones. So, uh, yeah, it's the first time I've seen that in a long time for one of these endurance races to have the fights be that close, especially for the class lead at the end. I mean, this was. This has probably been one of the best Le Mans races I've ever broadcast. The uh, the actual quality of racing was I was very very good. Absolutely, and uh, according if my math is correct, right now the point standings there's actually been some point gains even with all the close battles. Challenger still finished in front of Magnuson in his respective class. Fassi Ponti for the sportsman's class had a strong despite having some struggles. Was the best finishing one if I get it if I count correctly for his for the sportsmen's overall because of some of the attrition, and Claude Berval for the legends, he was a part of the drivers that ended up surviving and making it to the checker flag while many of the drivers were not a part of today's race, so a lot of them were able to position themselves to try and gain some more valuable points before the summer months. Yeah, and it, that's going to be a great thing, especially before we start getting into this. Uh more difficult stretch of the majors so uh good for all of them and uh the championship is uh probably gonna probably be heating up i think in all regards absolutely and it's going to be very intense i think and very heated when we go to the detroit grand prix again the major series heads to that on june the 23rd the weekend of starting with the international split then moving to the european split then finally the american split there is one more race for the major series this weekend. It's the American Split. GSRC has your coverage on the iRacing Esports Network. Watch that starting at about 7 p.m.-ish Eastern Time to see who comes away with the Jacker Flag 745, to be precise, is the start of your pre-race coverage during practice. 
But with that, it's time to say goodbye here on Race Spot TV, the iRacing Esports Network. For Randy Chenneth, I'm Justin Prince saying so long. Have a wonderful rest of your weekend. We'll see you next time.